Hi, good morning. Uh, so uh, I welcome all of you to this joint clinical session on uh, clinician's role in uh, healthcare quality and patient safety. And uh, today uh, we have a very eminent panel uh, to speak on this. And first I would like to invite the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association to uh, welcome you all. And I, I welcome all of you on behalf of the Sri Daivadhanapura Clinical Society, Daivadhanapura Hospital Clinical Society. And I would like to invite Dr. Vinyari Ratna to speak uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, thank you, good, Dr. Guchlani. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be uh, attending uh, this uh, seminar today, uh, the joint uh, regional meeting that we are conducting between uh, SLMA in collaboration with uh, the Clinical Society of Sri Jayavadanapura Hospital. I, it brings back uh, nostalgic memories because in 1989, 34 years ago, I was a trainee here and uh, I worked under uh, Dr. Sonnadar and Dr. Inis Jai Singer and uh, I came back I think once after that I'm coming only now and I have seen it's kind of a, yeah, I was here for six months uh, very intense training and uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be back here uh, Dr. Narnasiri Hevage director and all our eminent uh, speakers today and the staff and all the medical officers, uh, consultants of the Sri Jayavadanapura General Hospital and also all the uh, all our uh, doctors who are joining online uh, this uh, uh, webinar today. Uh, I would like to uh, again welcome all of you on behalf of the SLMA and also thank the Clinical Society of Sri Jayavadanapura Hospital, uh, General Hospital for organizing this. So uh, very briefly, the theme of SLMA for this year is towards human healthcare, equity and community. Why we chose this theme is that we all know during the last three years, our health sector and also in general, the healthcare delivery system has been under a lot of pressure, initially because of COVID-19, followed by the economic crisis. And also we have seen how it has manifested in uh, different ways in the lives of the people. And we all know that health is an outcome of many factors, not just the quality of care that we give to the patients. So as SLMA is having two strong uh, mandates, that's we have to serve our profession and we have to serve our nation. And to do that, we lead the medical community uh, to achieve the highest standards of medical professionalism and also ethical conduct. So when we look at the theme, uh, humane healthcare, it's just that we always emphasize on quality healthcare, but sometimes we have lapses uh, in the ethical dimensions uh, of, uh, of healthcare. Um, and also, um, we were looking at the three dimensions. One is excellence, the quality of care. So it is under that uh, objective of excellence that we are organizing this uh, webinar uh, today. And then we have equity. We all know, although we have achieved uh, very high standards of uh, health uh, care, health outcomes in terms of the standard uh, public health indicators like maternal mortality, infant mortality, and so on, we have seen a lot of disparities. The same indicator, if you apply to different uh, districts and look at the disaggregated data, it's not at all satisfactory. If you take, for example, the infant mortality rate, which is less than 10, uh, national average. If you look at the IMR of uh, um, New Aurelia, it's two, two times more than the national average. So these are disparities that we need to address. So as the apex medical organization of the professional body of uh, doctors in the country, Sri Lanka Medical Association has taken that task of somehow trying to uh, address these determinants of health as well. Finally, about the community, we need the public to be much more engaged in uh, uh, looking after their own health and also the public need to be involved in the, uh, in the healthcare service delivery as well. So that is why we are shifting now from uh, doctor-centered care to patient-centered care, now to citizen-centered healthcare. So uh, right to health is an important part of uh, the new discourse in public health, therefore, we have to have all these three different elements coming together, uh, maintaining higher standards of clinical care, addressing inequalities uh, in, the, in our systems, then also addressing the uh, engaging the community. 
So uh, with that introduction, I would like to uh, conclude by uh, saying that this is uh, regional meetings are part of our many activities and I would like to invite all of you uh, to attend our uh, International Medical Congress, which is the peak of our activities for a given year, uh, which will be held in, in July this year on the same theme. So please join, uh, you can uh, attend. There are very interesting and very uh, high quality sessions. And we of course have the publication. So uh, policy advocacy is also another uh, uh, thing that we do. So we, our aim is to um, really serve uh, for the good of all Sri Lankans without delay. Thank you very much. So the first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Vimal Karandagoda, who is a senior medical administrator and who has made a landmark contribution to the quality and safety in uh, Sri Lankan hospitals, uh, who had qualified as a medical uh, officer in, uh, with MBBS from the University of Peradeniya in 1981 and masters in medical administration in 1996. And he has undergone many uh, training session, uh, workshops, uh, training uh, events, and also Health Service Management Center of University. Uh, he's a scholar of the Health Service Management Center of the University of Birmingham, United Kingdom. And uh, he has worked, uh, we know all of you, I think, are familiar with what he has done to many hospitals, including the Castle Street Hospital and the Lanka Hospital. Uh, uh, as a, a person who was in charge of quality and safety and making them uh, excellent uh, hospitals uh, in the country. Uh, so without uh, much, uh, oh, uh, I think all of you know about him. So there's a big CV, but I'm not going to read all that. But I invite uh, Dr. Karandagada to deliver his speech uh, on this uh, topic today, uh, what the doctors should do and uh, what the problems we have been uh, having uh, and what why we should talk about this topic over to you good morning to you uh, 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 the uh, president president of sri lanka medical association uh, uh, distinct uh, dear uh, panelists uh, and the director of uh, sri jayadanapura hospital consultants uh, and staff and the uh, participants of this uh, important uh, symposium today. Uh, this, uh, it is a privilege for me to uh, deliver this uh, presentation. Uh, this uh, deliver the uh, presentation uh, as uh, the president uh, this uh, conveyed to us. It is uh, very important uh, during this era. Actually, patient safety. When you talk about patient safety. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, it is an urgency of world health organization as well uh, due to the fact that uh, globally all the countries are facing the challenge of uh, patient safety so the who has given the topmost priority uh, to uh, introduce uh, this this one, uh, this one. So I had been uh, involved uh, in this subject uh, the, from the way back in 1990. We, are, this, uh, we have to give uh, due respect to Dr. Uh, Reggie Pereira, who was uh, one of our secretaries and the director generals of uh, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, who pioneered uh, introducing uh, quality healthcare in 1988-89, period as a pilot project in Kurunagala district. So then, uh, uh, then onwards, we had been involving and then we had been pre-testing uh, quality and uh, quality health care. Actually speaking, uh, during 1990s and early 20, 2000, we were not talking much about patient safety. So we were focusing on quality health care because we had the many issues of uh, uh, systems in the country. Uh, so this, uh, uh, by that time, uh, even uh, this... Uh, uh, the globally, uh, even USA, United Kingdom, and the Western world also not focusing much on patient safety. Uh, so then, uh, this uh, the patient safety, uh, the the interest uh, in patient safety it was initiated uh, mostly in uh, late 1990s and uh, with the beginning of the new millennium. 
So that's what uh, I'm going to give some overview. Uh, so then uh, if you talk about, uh, to begin with, uh, if you talk about this quality and patient safety, so what is quality? So quality is the totality of features of a product or services that bears on its ability to satisfy given needs. So this is the general most, uh, you know, this uh, understandable uh, definition of quality. So when it comes to healthcare, especially the hospital services, the quality means the degree of adherence to standards consistent with current professional knowledge. So uh, it implies that uh, quality is pivotal around the standards and the latest professional knowledge. So, uh, so it is understood, the more we get close to the standards, we say that we have good quality, excellence quality, delighted quality. So standards are very important. So when we comply with standards, uh, we, uh, bring in outcomes to the uh, patients and the care seekers. So that is what we have, we should be worried about, not the outputs, the outcomes. So outcomes are very important. So then patient safety is outcomes. So this is the final outcome for, of our healthcare services. So outcomes, so if you, if you have satisfactory outcomes means that we have achieved patient safety. So when you take the history of uh, patient safety, so history, if you want to talk patient safety, we can uh, go back even before 2000 years. So there, there had been interest during the, those days in the Western world where they have given even capital punishment for people who have not complied with patient safety. But I have taken from uh, this 1853, 1853 to 1855. So the first, uh, you know, this uh, known, uh, uh, this uh, patient safety uh, events are described by this uh, during Crimean War, this uh, clinical audit of Florence Nightingale, uh, where this uh, she uh, demonstrated that uh, all these deaths taking place in the war are not due to uh, the solely not due to the war, but it, it has some connection with the improving hygienic conditions and then it has reduced the mortality rates. In 1912, audit of surgical outcomes by Dr. Codman, uh, I think Ranjan might uh, speak more about this. And then 1918, American College of Surgeons introduced the hospital standardization program. Uh, later on, it was uh, adopted by the Joint Commission International. And then 1900 to 1949, American College of Surgeons developed first set of hospital standards. And then 1950 to 1989, the American surgeons uh, and the physicians got together and formed the Joint Commission uh, accreditation. And then later, it was uh, refined and uh, developed uh, presently known as jo uh, Joint Commission International. So 1970s, it's a landmark uh, in patient safety where Institute of Medicine, United States uh, was formed and then they were focusing more uh, with the clinicals, they were focusing on uh, quality and patient safety. And then uh, we'll take uh, 1980s. So 1980s, the concept of quality improvement was uh, uh, talked during this period. So from 1980 to 1990, late 1990s, even the Western worlds, they were focusing uh, much on quality improvement. So the, their uh, wordings were going as quality assurance, quality assurance in healthcare. So then uh, this uh, later on, they understood that quality assurance is not uh, this wholly taken up by hospital staff because it was uh, more concentrated among the clinicians and the top level management only. Uh, so then uh, they were focusing on, the, then later on it was transformed to quality improvements instead of uh, quality assurance. So what they said was, instead of talking quality in a concealed environment, open, open the quality management 
and uh, instead of quality circle, uh, have quality spiral uh, open it. So then uh, the uh, biggest uh, uh, this uh, movement takes place in 1990. So 1990, what happened? So 1990, people are focusing on quality. And then here, a very special uh, thing happened in 1990. What, uh, what was it during 1990s? It was this. So during 1999, uh, the Institute of, uh, Institute of Medicine, uh, they did a lengthy uh, this study in United States and they released this uh, very you know, the challenging document to erase human. So then uh, this was an eye opener for the whole world. You know, the, until such time, uh, you, even nobody working for the health uh, understood that such a disaster is taking place in uh, health, health sector, especially in hospitals throughout the world. So then uh, what did this say? The Institute of Medicine released a report in 1999 entitled To Erase Human, Building a Safe Health System. The report stated that errors cause between 44,000 to 98,000 deaths every year in American hospitals and over 1 million injuries. Healthcare appeared uh, to be far behind other high risk industries ensuring basic safety. The IOM report called for a 50% reduction in medical errors over five years. Its goal was to break the cycle of inaction regarding medical errors by advocating a comprehensive approach to improve patients' safety. So then I have read this book, and then uh, this gives a very uh, pathetic stories about uh, patient deaths, uh, which has taken place in uh, hospitals. So then uh, with this uh, document published, the WHO, it was an eye opener for World Health Organization as well. So then World Health Organization in uh, uh, 2002, uh, the World S Health Assembly has declared that they had to focus on patient safety. And then 2005, the WHO Global Alliance for Patient <coughs> Safety was formed in Geneva. So uh, what is patient safety? So now uh, patient safety has become a discipline. Uh, in uh, healthcare industry, a healthcare discipline that emerged with the evolving complexity in healthcare systems and the resulting rise of patient harm in health facilities. So it's a discipline now where this, everyone should get involved, everyone should study, everyone should be uh, scrutinized. So if we define patient safety, what is it? Patient safety is the absence of preventable harm to a patient during the process of healthcare and reduction of the risk of unnecessary harm associated with healthcare to an acceptable minimum. Uh, emphasis, is, emphasis is placed on the system of care delivery that prevent errors, learn from errors, is built on a culture of safety that involves professionals, organizations, and patients. So then uh, in summary, so preventable harm, no excuse, we should say no. Say one good example is uh, legible handwriting. So legible, legible handwriting, everyone can do. So we, it is a preventable harm if you write eligible handwriting. Then risk of unnecessary harm. Risk of unnecessary harm, we have to reduce. In hospital sector, definitely we can make it zero, uh, like in uh, high-risk industries. So you know we, we have to make sure that we have to focus that there can be unnecessary uh, risk of unnecessary harm, but then we have to be prepared and we have to make sure it is reduced and minimize the damage. So errors, so what do you mean by errors? 
failure of a planned action to be completed as intended, a rough execution, or the use of a wrong plan to achieve an action. So that is error of planning. So error of execution is one thing, error of planning. So you, you know, institute a wrong planning and then the wrong planning is uh, correct, uh, done properly. So then the patient's death will happen. So I will give you one uh, small example where uh, this uh, one patient, 53-year-old uh, patient, male patient, uh, came to an emergency. And then the patient has a history of diabetes and hypertension. Patient complained uh, uh, this uh, uh, burning sensation of the chest. And then uh, patient was uh, in another hospital about two weeks back and the, the ECG showed some uh, changes. And this patient was admitted to a medical ward. And then this patient, uh, after admission, the consultant also has seen, but during around 10 o'clock uh, during night, the patient had said, had sweating and wheezing. And then uh, this uh, patient has no history of bronchial asthma, but the medical officer diagnosed, number one diagnosis was bronchial asthma. So the patient was nebulized and it came a little better. And then the patient slept and that uh, four, four o'clock in the morning, they found that the patient is dead, dead on the bed. So that means, you know, this, uh, uh, the, the medical officer has not worked out the scenarios, the history, the comorbidities and the symptoms and uh, taken a collective decision and come to a most probable diagnosis. So that is zero plan. So adverse events. Now what is an adverse event? An unintended event that harms the patient or carries a risk of harm as a consequence of the action or lack of action of the health services. So all these adverse events are uh, defined in that way. And then near miss. So in near miss, uh, definitely and a mistake has happened, but it has not reached the target. It has not reached the patient. So errors that could have caused harm to patients but did not as a result of chance, prevention, or mitigation. So uh, in brief, the adverse events are, it's a patient safety event that resulted in harm to a patient. Then uh, the uh, Joint Commission International has uh, described uh, all the other events like this, a uh, no harm event. It's a patient safety event that reaches the patient but does not cause <coughs> harm. A near miss or a close call is a patient safety event that did not reach the patient. So then JCI uh, seventh edition, they have uh, specified another harm, a hazardous condition or an unsafe condition in hospitals. So what is it? Is a circumstance other than a patient's own disease process or condition that increases the probability of an adverse event. So say for instance, a leak in roof in a ward, right? Uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this air condition, defective air condition in the intensive care unit, which can result, uh, you know, germinating uh, uh, infections and then cause harm to the patients. Uh, incidents like that, so they have categorized into a hazardous conditions. So then another important thing is a sentinel event. So what is, an, uh, what is a sentinel event? It is a serious event. Any anticipated event in a healthcare setting resulting in death or serious physical or psychological injury to a patient uh, or so any anticipated event in a healthcare setting resulting in death. So the patient's death take place.
or serious physical or psychological injury to a patient or patients not related to the natural cause of the patient's illness. So sentinel events are serious events. So we need to do a root cause analysis. It is a must. Uh, when a sentinel event takes place in the hospital, and a root cause analysis should be done and then take corrective actions uh, further. <coughs> so what do you mean by safety culture? So when you, uh, when you know about patient safety, so uh, the safety culture is it is the responsibility of everyone from the top level management up to the bottom. So all the staff should get mobilized for patient safety uh, inside the uh, hospital or a healthcare facility. So the, the degree of top level management and staff commitment to develop and sustain the organization structure and systems focusing on improving quality of patient care services to ensure patients and employees safety. So that means uh, in every hospital, there should be a quality management system. So if there is no quality management system in the hospital, we can't talk about patient safety. It is like a human being without a skeleton. So quality management system is a must. So patient safety can occur in uh, different areas. So these are the areas. So the clinical care is very important. So that is the core, core business of the hospital. So the core business should be looked after very well. So then the supportive services, the transfusion safety, medication safety, then around the non-medical support services, the housekeeping, food safety, facility safety, fire. So all these things should be uh, taken into uh, patient safety movement. So as clinicians, we have a big role to play the uh, clinical care. So clinical care, it's a big issue. So, so it's, it's a well-coordinated effort uh, where a, a, a team effort. So now uh, we have to understand uh, all human beings, including ourselves, you know, this uh, maybe that we are educated, but we make mistakes. It is our Varadima Minisgatya, Samavadima Devagatya. So at every point during our life, we, we make mistakes and uh, this uh, unintended, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we get into mistakes. So human factors acknowledge universal nature of human fallibility. Optimize relationship between technology and human being and reporting mistakes will correct the system. So that uh, we accept that we will make mistakes. So we <laughs> learn from mistakes. And then other thing is, human factors and ergonomics. Study of all the factors that make it easier to do the work in the right way. So we, we need to study that as well with this advancement of technology. So it is about understanding human limitations and designing the workplace and equipment in use in order to facilitate our clinical activities. So then what happens uh, people? So why do people make mistakes? So people make mistakes due to stress. So then due to poor communication, fatigue, then unskilled, and then multitasking, and then distraction. So all these uh, things can cause mistakes, not even in our this, uh, official life, even in our personal life, we make mistakes and then we get into trouble because of these areas. So what happens? So now when a person becomes fatigued, so then the fatigued patient uh, is a dangerous person. So then with fatigue, then memory lapses happen and then mood changes. The, pa uh, the person becomes angry. So then uh, uh, patients become anxiety and then uh, the person becomes uh, depression so then the fatigue leads to depression around depression there are many things can happen so then it will lead to mistakes and then technological devices if you mishandle it will cause mistakes 
So this is also very important uh, nowadays. And then healthcare teams. So it is very important in clinical settings, the healthcare teams man managing the patients uh, as a team is very important. There, there had been a lot of uh, incidents reported due to lack of uh, team uh, concepts. So effective team is a team where a team members, including the patient, communicate with each other as well as merging their observations, expertise, and decision-making responsible to optimize patient care. So people are very reluctant. And nowadays the fashion is people uh, never see the team members never get together at the patient side. And then they talk to each other or sometimes they do not talk, they go through the PhDs and they, they mess up the uh, patient. There had been many instances like this. In Joint Commission International, uh, now just to give a little overview, Joint Commission International is one of the, this, uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> biggest uh, accreditation uh, institutions. So they have their uh, standards sorted out separately, the patient care standards and the organization standards. Why they have done so? Here, they want to uh, analyze, they want to uh, this, uh, assess the patient's uh, care pathway separately from uh, the beginning up to the end. And then in the meantime, they want to assess the systems uh, inside the hospital, how the system supports for patient uh, safety. So there are a number of standards, uh, which I know will not go uh, elaborate too much. And then they are very specific about this international patient safety goals, right? So patient identification, effective communication, and then uh, safety of high alert medications, then the safe surgery, and then healthcare associated infections, and then patient harm resulting from falls. Even JCI will not accredit any hospital, even if you pass all the other standards, if you, if you have uh, even one mistake from international patient safety goals, they will not give the accreditation certificate. So these are, uh, this is one example where, you know, if you think that, you know, uh, this, uh, if we are making repeated mistakes, we have to identify various devices, checklist techniques in order to have visual control. So this is one example where discharge checklist, discharge patients making mistakes and dispensing wrong drugs, you know, so that identify patients correctly is written in uh, red ink. So that uh, it is eye-catching, uh, this uh, wording for the discharge nurse. So finally, the actions on human factors for patient uh, safety is avoid relying on memory. So have good updated short protocols. Then number two, standardize common processes and procedures. Number three, simplify processes, checklist, personal checklist of performance, make things visual as much as possible. And then reliance and vigilance is very important. So this is, uh, you know, all, all this we must make sure hospitals should have frequent uh, seminars, symposiums, training on patient safety. So it is the top priority. So this is, uh, I just showing one, I'm showing one example where Lanka hospitals had 2009, 19, uh, about this incident reporting, incident reporting culture. To bring in that culture, we had a symposium like this. So thank you very much for patient safety. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, now uh, the next speaker, uh, we will go to the next speaker and later we'll have a discussion. Uh, so the next speaker would be uh, Dr. Sridharan Satasivam. Uh, uh, she, he is uh, actually uh, the Deputy Director General Planning in the Ministry of Health. And uh, I think uh, I invited him because he has been the Director of Quality and Safety for a long period and he is a person who had worked very hard uh, during that period uh, to improve the quality and safety in the Ministry of uh, min, uh, the Ministry of Hospitals and the healthcare delivered by the Ministry. Uh, so I, I know that uh, he was uh, 
uh, one of the main uh, persons working on this uh, and uh, i'm not going to discuss i think uh, go in detail but uh, so i would like to invite uh, dr sridharan to deliver his uh, uh, speech on what uh, a doctor should do what's the doctor's role in improving quality and safety Thank you, Dr. Kushlani, and uh, good morning to you all. Um, President SLMA, consultants of uh, Sri Jayawardenepura Hospital, and doctors, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I must thank uh, Dr. Kushlani Jayatilaka for inviting me uh, for this session, uh, which is my bread and butter uh, those days and now also. And um, uh, when I uh, after my master's, when I took over, uh, when I went to Castle Street Hospital, uh, Dr. Karanda Goda was director. Uh, that is about 22 years ago. Um, at that time also, most of the work he did for me. And today also, most of the slides I'm going to present, he did. <laughs> so I have a little, <laughs> little to talk. So <clears throat> medical error, it is the third leading cause um, of death in the USSR. It is more than the um, road traffic accidents. But um, in the UK, 12.5 uh, readmissions are due to uh, medication errors. Uh, but in Sri Lanka, we don't know. I'll come to that later. So these are some uh, slides. I'm not sure that uh, the, the media is highlighting. So one in 10 patients will be harmed during hospital state WHO in 2014. Uh, that is 10% uh, of the patients. Uh, they say that it is an average of developed and developing countries, and it will be more in uh, developing countries and less in developed countries where the systems are more robust. They have more robust system. So in USA, um, hospital associated infections, 5% um, chance of contracting a hospital occurred infection. Uh, Dr. Kushlani will know more than, uh, more, more, more than me. And 30% of intensive care unit patients develop hospital acquired infections in USA. And uh, and um, uh, this infection alone, HI alone cost uh, 28 to 33 billion uh, per year US dollars in uh, USA, in US dollars. So it is much more than our uh, national health budget. So it is not a problem within the inpatients. 8.8 .8 million outpatient uh, adverse drug events, more than 3 million are estimated to be preventable in outpatients, especially primary care. So as uh, Dr. Karanda would have told, um, this illegible handwriting. In 2015, a study was done. 65% are illegible handwriting. So you can see, uh, this is a hospital. This is not a private sheet. They are written the numbers of the drug. Each num drug was given a number. And the uh, dispenser or the uh, attendant have to give uh, the drugs according to the number. And here, see this, um, this, uh, that's the, the second one. P and something 5 milligram, P something 4 milligram. I don't know what it is, but then I asked what it is. And so that attendant told, sir, make a five million, I can say make a prisoner alone. <laughs> no, this is, a, this is the truth. And when we visited, uh, sir, we'll know, when we visited to these hospitals, only very few hospitals uh, had uh, this uh, sample signature of the doctors working in the OPD. None of the hospitals had, but it should be there. Because otherwise, who knows uh, who prescribed this drug? Anybody can uh, take the chit, write some drugs, and uh, take it. And uh, <clears throat> the same study uh, in one hospital, it is a tertiary care hospital. Uh, the, in, in a dermatology clinic, they prescribed uh, five milligrams of a cream. And uh, that hospital, particular hospital, had only 10 milligrams, uh, 10 grams of this, um, what you call this, uh, 10 grams of this cream. What they did, they cut this tube into two and gave one. So this one, see, this, uh, uh, this is a lack of supervision, actually. Uh, this uh, is a uh, divisional hospital. 
where this uh, this this bulb on this um, what do you call this lamp uh, for this uh, warm the baby it loosely fitted any time the bulb might fall okay it happened in 1988 uh, in a maternity hospital in colombo uh, the bulb fall fell down and the the baby started uh, crying but uh, the nurses are very happy doctors nurses are very happy because the baby is crying after the birth but the crying is not for other reason for this one the, the, see just in front of the maternity care maternity ward the car is parked how the the the, the patient can taken this uh, this uh, in bhts and drug uh, books we often see that uh, this tipex are used very frequently you can't use tipex in official documents even uh, the the office files minutes you can't use tipex you have to cut in one single line so don't use tipex see this uh, under the mattresses and uh, this how many times this uh, hospital staff would have gone there's a wi electric wire hanging so in an uh, emer uh, in an urgency emergency some might hit this uh, wire and get uh, electric shock this one uh, we are saying that we have to reduce the tb 50% in 2025 and so on so on here this picture was taken on 7th january 2016 by me and uh, the notification of tb was done uh, on uh, 11th uh, 10th uh, no 14th november 2014 and when we visited when we saw this notification register this notification form is in the still in the register they are not notified on time and picture was taken on 6th uh, 7th january 2016 these are the roles of our doctors all the notifiable diseases should be notified and you have to see that um, the the notification forms are sent to the relevant mohs or uh, epid unit on time so <clears throat> half of the global burden of patient harms are occurs from primary care institutions okay it is estimated that 80% uh, of harm in primary care settings can be avoided so that's why when this uh, primary the pssp primary care strengthening project came we um, emphasized that patient safety uh, should be uh, accommodated and uh, who also agrees with that and um, now you know that uh, this patient falls we take it uh, patient falls very lightly we just uh, write to uh, director that uh, patient uh, there's a patient fall and director says uh, noted that's all so recently very recently a study was done uh, at nhsl the a patient fall cost 88000 rupees to sri lankan government health our health sector one patient fall okay so you you just think how many falls occur in your hospital and how the cost can be saved so this is um, again uh, what uh, sir told patient safety definition i am going to describe here um, described very well the avoidance prevention and amelioration of adverse outcomes or injuries stemming from the process of healthcare so i towards uh, improvement all events as he told in the reality all events are not reported uh, up to the uh, we have only the reported events okay so we have the data we have to analyze the data and understand why it has happened root cause and analysis we have to do the root cause analysis and learn from the events that is very important we have to learn from the events and um, feedback to the reporter so if ward the medical ward ward 4 has reported we have to give feedback to the report the reporter what 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 was our findings what were our findings and there should be a culture change as uh, sir told and um, when we introduced this uh, adverse event form in 2016 directed healthcare quality and safety uh, we started that one in uh, 2014 uh, slma was highly involved in that one uh, that process and uh, 
Dr. Ranjan Dias knows very well. He was he was also involved. And um, when we uh, started piloting one hospital, they uh, reported about 60 adverse events per month and came back, came down to 40, then 30, 32 or something. So we asked why. They told, sir, we are reporting cases and we don't know what happens. Now, patient satisfaction survey. Now, we don't go for patient satisfaction survey. Uh, we have to go for patient experience survey. And uh, now, the director of healthcare quality and safety is working on that. Um, we have to give feedback uh, after the survey to the uh, in the heads of uh, the, the heads of unit, HOI uh, meetings. We have to give the feedback to the hospital staff. And this is not enough. I'm saying this is not enough. Fix the system. You have to fix the system so that adverse event will not occur again. Even a small change, small change, but it, it will give, have a big impact because uh, people, the staff will have uh, confidence with you. Because if you fix, fix the system, if, if uh, the adverse event does not occur again, then the staff will have confidence with you and they will start reporting more and more cases. So, so no, nobody likes uh, while entering this ward, nobody will think that I want to harm this patient, I want to kill this patient. Everybody wants uh, the patient should go praise the ward and go. So because people don't report or don't report these adverse events, because uh, we are more focusing on who uh, did that wrong, not uh, what went wrong. So we are more in the patient safety program, uh, we are more focusing on what went wrong, no, not who. Okay. And the other thing is, um, we are not going to react to a situation. How, not shouting and uh, giving how, because, but we are responding a situation. Responding. So what is the difference between the young doctors? What is the um, difference between reacting to a situation and responding to a situation? Reacting to a situation, you go to a restaurant, a cockroach comes. You all shout. The cockroach jumps to the next table. You all sh others shout. And next table, they also shout. And the waiter comes with the forceps. He removes the cockroach. What you all did was reacting to a situation. But what the waiter did, he was responding to a situation. So in same example, we can adapt in a hospital setting also. We have to, as a doctor, we have to react to a situation, not to react to a situation, but to respond to a situation and try to uh, fix the system so that the adverse event will not occur again. So <clears throat> safety culture, how to develop the safety culture. So uh, Dr. Karanda Goda explained what is safety culture. So informed culture, that is, um, uh, we have to give current knowledge about the factors that determine the safety of the system. Every day, new things are happening. Uh, we have to give um, adequate knowledge uh, to the uh, staff. Uh, so frequent training programs, training, and even uh, this uh, high reliability organizations. There are five elements. One element is training, training, and training. And the reporting culture, pe people are prepared to report their errors and near misses. And just culture, here we are not going to uh, like, uh, uh, like um, protect anyone. If there's a real negligence, there should be some sort of punishment. At the same time, we must encourage and even reward for better, uh, providing safety related information um, and must be clear about what is acceptable, non-acceptable behavior. That way we must be clear. And uh, there are some hospitals which uh, promote or give uh, incentives for those who are reporting more Adverse events and uh, Dr. Karanda Goda, sir, you have in your day in Lanka hospitals, you did for this nursing officer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, learning culture, willingness and know to, to draw the right conclusion from a safety information system and to implement reforms. This is uh, actually we have to learn from um, airline industries. Like if the uh, orange wire, which, which is in the engine, let us say uh, Emirates 747 flight. 
uh, if emirates find uh, some sort of error they reply it and they see in their 747 flights whether they the same error is uh, there and if if they correct it everything and they write, they write to iata and iata send uh, to other airlines like sri lankan singapore qatar um, malaysian airlines and to see their 747 that orange wire okay so they also check it and report to iata so this is what we have to do in hospitals also it is not to hide in the clinical meetings you have to freely discuss about these adverse events because we have to learn from uh, our own mistakes the for usually uh, wise people learn from others mistake but we have to learn from the mistakes so this this is uh, very important that's what we are asking uh, this adverse events uh, this uh, incident reporting mechanisms and um, do clinical audits so <clears throat> When uh, young doctors, they go for this uh, foreign training, in the interview, they ask, uh, what is your adverse event reporting mechanism? How many clinical audits you have done? And so on. Other one is open culture. So uh, the last slide uh, of uh, Dr. Karanda Goda was this open culture. The staff feel comfortable discussing patient safety incidents, raising uh, safety issues with both colleagues and senior managers so everybody is comfort everybody should uh, contribute uh, not only one person dominating the meetings so just culture is uh, amnesty you know blame free it is real if it is not negligent if it is due to system failure that is uh, if you take if you analyze this patient safety this incidents 85 to 90 percent are due to system failure so it is a system fault we cannot hold the provider accountable Okay, so we have to there we have to improve the system, whereas it is a individual failure, it is the provider's fault. Okay, provider's fault. So leadership in patient safety, like doctors, you all willing not to meet monthly minimum. You all meet meet monthly at least. Um, we prefer preferably before the ward rounds, uh, you have to have some um, discussion about the patients. Those who those who did this night on call should brief about the major admissions, okay? Not routine, then some emergency admissions. Participate in executive runs, odd rounds, review safety data summaries, ensure team has resources to reduce risk. So that you have to analyze. What are the risks? What are the resources you need? Collaborate with teams on solutions. So that should be a teamwork, as he told earlier. Supports technical efforts, supports adaptive efforts and members of the patient and there should be a quality improvement team and and um, there should be members of the quality and safety team and uh, i don't think um, everybody can be the team but in the unit wise you can have the work improvement team now it's uh, so uh, quality circles no, no, popularly known as in uh, manufacturing sector and uh, the most effective communication should be there accuracy young doctors have to when they talking to the consultant they have to give accurate information with clear brief Timely information. You can't uh, delay the information which are uh, in an emergency case. Or complete and structure. There should be a structure when you are uh, uh, giving this case history to the consultants because you can't say, I forgot that one and this one. Okay. So there should be ICC, no? Introduction, context, and conclusion. So, adding over, this is another area which is lacking in uh, patient safety. That is the handing over. So one fifth include omissions and inaccurate information, and the most do not uh, include um, questions from and of recipients. And uh, we spend less than a minute uh, for handing over patients. Okay, even uh, this. Uh, if you go to these uh, wards today, you go to the ward, you see this. That's a book called uh, handing over book. No handing over book. So you see how the patients are handed over. Okay. So there are three shifts for the nurses and doctors uh, uh, also. Okay. So how doctors are handing over? I don't know how doctors are handing over. Uh, usually doctors don't hand over, no? just over the phone. patient can On the corridor, in the car park. That's all. Okay. So <clears throat> teamwork is important, no? Task appropriateness, effective conflict management. The conflict management, the conflict occurs when you're working with the, as a team. Conflict occurs. 
that is uh, we can't avoid those conflict but the conflict should be task related not people oriented not to attack any individual okay that that is more important we say. so the task related can be easily converted to a, a individual oriented conflict but very difficult from individual oriented to a task related so don't attack individuals mama oya gana dannad oya ara i mean ara kunu shirt ekan dagana ave faculty kale den apita kiyala dino then these things happen no so you should not do that things those things okay <clears throat> mutual support each each one support each other and trust there should be trust and <clears throat> team drive success in phd work science of study teams proactively seeking different views so we have to see proactively what we can do so there are some tools like uh, failure modes and defect analysis so proactively you can see what are the errors can occur so you have to proactively you can prevent those errors respecting the value each bring so even a small uh, junior doctor might give some suggestions so we have to accept it okay so you can't uh, decline uh, uh, maybe it is not a very good one but uh, you have to accept uh, how we brought that one continuously focusing on teamwork so <clears throat> so as a doctor now you you need situation awareness status of the patient step approach status of the patient patient history you must know vital signs medications what are the medications taking are you when you are doing the ward rounds are you checking the drug chart okay so we have seen that uh, when we did this uh, visit the hospital we saw that uh, in some drug charts the drugs uh, whether it is given or not it's not entered they then they said sir make out of stock here so if you go through the drug chart you can ask nurses then they will say Uh, physical examination plan of care what is the plan and psychosocial condition of the patient team members fatigue workforce task performance skill level and stress level so individual factors that predispose to error limited memory capacity further reduced by fatigue stress as he told earlier hunger uh, illness language or cultural factors and hazardous attitudes so don't forget as a doctors if you are hungry angry late tired halt if if you are late you try to uh, speed up and end up with a mistake <clears throat> so you have to start you, first uh, sir show this discharge checklist and i i think you must also have a checklist see if the i am safe illness don't do if you are on medication some uh, sedatives if you are taken be careful if you are in a stress situation or your colleague or nurse in a stress situation please be careful under the influence of alcohol never fatigue never and emotion your loved one is admitted to the dengue fever so your mind is there physically you are here but mentally you are somewhere else so am i safe to work today ask you ask yourself <clears throat> and environment facility information administrative information human resources triage equity and equipment and progress toward goal status of teams patients goal of team uh actions completed actions that are needed plan still appropriate so how to use even um, recording uh, data finding a uh, system defects so you have to only way is by uh, adverse repetitive mechanisms or doing root cause analysis or doing failure modes and defect analysis monitoring new processes you have to keep on monitoring if you are introducing something new keep on monitoring and identifying good catches identifying good practices okay and uh, that should be um, communicated or disseminated to other units also monitoring policy compliance and monitoring policy effectiveness conducting deep drives like go deep and deep and good uh, find uh, find good practices and trends after change you implement something what happened before that after the implementation whether it has changed you have to monitor very carefully and doctor's role 
this is a summary of last two slides doctors told patient safety this we talked enough reducing preventable errors through such basics hand hygiene are we washing our hands so we uh, started monitoring related started monitoring reporting errors and using patient safety checklists quality improvement involving in efforts to improve healthcare services and patient outcomes health equity and uh, quality improvement and patient safety achieving the highest level of health for all the goal of this domain to that doctor need to identify local services at its patients for example the re uh, resident needs to be able to explain the effects of social determinants of health so this is very important now i'll tell a <clears throat> case study uh, which is really happened a uh, few months ago couple of months ago there's a family uh, like with wife husband and son they have a quarrel physically they assaulted each other okay and admitted to a hospital divisional hospital <clears throat> on admission uh, they had some lacerations and uh, treated <clears throat> but uh, the husband uh, and they want to uh, transfer to jmo issues they want to transfer to a division the district general hospital okay but uh, the father complained of uh, tightness of chest and difficulty in breathing but uh, the what the doctor but uh, they want to put all three into one ambulance the hospital had that time one, only one ambulance and uh, the, the the family members they refused to go in one ambulance okay so what they did the father uh, they gave the reference or whatever it is and go by hand and go you personally you go and admitted to the hospital and uh, daughter and mother went in ambulance the father didn't go to the district general hospital he went home and for finally um, at after two hours he had severe chest pain came to this hospital and uh, then they sent to this division district general hospital on the way he died the hospital had ecg the hospital had multi para monitors never used that one even though he complained of chest pain okay this is what happened very recently so i am just now now i am collecting this um, case studies on uh, patient safety of my interest but uh, this is one of the case studies uh, given to me this is really happened this is a real story so whether if the patient the husband was attended adequately at that time on his admission first admission he would have saved them okay so this is uh, what uh, we were telling social determinants of health and uh, resident needs patient and families uh, as uh, quality improvement patient safety partners engaging with patients and their families respectfully and collaborative lies in the heart of this compete, uh, competency among the necessary skills of obtaining informed consent are we getting informed consent of the patient make asangaran asangaran nattam surgery karanda be keeping patient concerned about cost in mind so I, as i told cost in mind no and uh, knowing how to discuss an adverse event uh, safety even not to find fault with anyone this is uh, repeatedly i am asking people will not come and say that i want to kill this patient i want to do harm this harm to this patient okay so we have to see the environment which made for this harm teamwork collaboration and coordination the interprofessional competency in knows communicating and coordinating effectively skills here include requesting a consult uh, in a clear and timely fashion as well as melding recommendations from different providers to maximize patient care and uh, this is already explained um, the patient safety goals and uh, this is who also accept this <clears throat> uh, six patient safety goals and um, sri lanka did the um, first uh, Uh, patient safety uh, side event uh, in 2016 so our minister was also participated and i presented so german and uh, uk ministers were there and um, then they uh, know, came to know what we have doing what we are doing on patient safety then uh, they told that uh, we'll include uh, german and um, UK health ministers told we will uh, include uh, Sri uh, Sri Lanka for the interministerial summit on patient safety. So that's why 
that's how this um, sri lanka came into interministerial uh, committee on uh, patient safety and uh, 2017 i think 2018 so the meeting was held in germany our minister participated at that meeting uh, german uk and japanese health ministers they with our health minister they had a in a room they had a meeting and they came to a conclusion that we must pre- or we for to to bring a resolution on patient safety in who so at that time minister told you coordinate with that and i coordinated <clears throat> and uh, this is very difficult uh, dr allen knows uh, even to introduce uh, include a one word there are so many questions so i want to just include the, the patient safety culture they asked so many questions and uh, i wrote about 18 pages at that time i can remember and um, oh, september 70 is the patient safety day and at that time we were discussing about a few days and i proposed uh, september 17th uh, because uh, our directed healthcare quality and safety was started on september 17 2012 commission so so other days they had some other international day so september 17th was comfortable for everybody so the resolution brought and uh, every two years we have to each country has to uh, produce uh, their progress on patient safety based on these uh, goals okay so in to, it was passed in 2019 and 2021 uh, we did that one and uh, this year also in world health assembly uh, the countries have to uh, have to produce their uh, present their um, progress on patient safety and with that uh, i conclude thank you very much thank you dr sridharan uh, now uh, i think uh, the next speaker will talk about one of those uh, important areas the surgical safety uh, the patients uh, who are undergoing surgery what errors can happen and how we can prevent that uh, so i invite uh, dr ranjan dias who is uh, uh, also a, a very keen a person who, i mean person who had been working with uh, quality and safety for a long time as i know uh, i have been the chairperson of the slma uh, expert committee on uh, healthcare quality and safety where dr ranjan dias was a very keen participant uh, so i invited him to talk on uh, the patient safety in surgery or surgical safety uh, over to you sir first of all i i would like to thank uh, dr ushalani jayatilok and the council of the clinical society of the sri jayawardena general hospital and uh, dr vinya ariratna and his council of the slma for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts about patient safety in surgical practice and uh, again i am i feel privileged to associate with my co panelists who are real experts in this field who has con- who have contributed immensely to this country and i have worked with them and i am no expert in this field but i have a very keen interest so if you have any questions uh, i would advise you to direct those questions to the experts uh, and and uh, Uh, i will focus mainly on patient safety but when you take the topic uh, broad topic surgical safety i don't think we can ignore uh, the availability and access of surgical uh, quality surgical care to the people and that is also a problem so without that i think uh, when you broadly think surgical safety it involves uh, safety of surgical 
care as well as availability and uh, accessibility of surgical care. Uh, uh, within the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk on very briefly what is patient safety. Already these things have been discussed, so my task is much easier. Uh, then magnitude of the problem in surgical practice, some definitions relevant to surgery, and what is surgical errors. Then uh, WHO declaration of uh, safe surgery saves life, that slogan, which is uh, considered the second global patient safety challenge. Uh, then uh, 10 objectives for safe surgery. Uh, then a few words about surgical safety checklist. Then uh, Sri Lankan situation, uh, how to ensure surgical safety in our surgical practice and role of surgical care providers in ensuring patient safety. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you know that uh, safety or safe care is one of the key components of quality, which includes effective efficient, accessible, acceptable, and equitable services, but safety is of high significance. Already this, uh, this has been defined in slightly different way. Uh, again, it's almost the same thing in different words. Avoidance, prevention, and amelioration of adverse outcomes of injuries stemming from the process of healthcare. I think this is important. Uh, we are talking about patient safety and adverse events in that context. If the patient gets a complication due to the disease process, that is not considered an adverse event or a patient safety event. Then uh, magnitude of the problem already discussed in general terms, but I will focus more on the surgical aspects. Uh, the WHO has at a few years ago has estimated 234 million major surgeries per year. They have defined what major surgery is also worldwide. It's a huge number per a year. Uh, and major complications in 3 to 16% depends on different countries. Uh, obviously, the developing countries have higher rates. And death rate of 0.4 to 0.8 in industrialized countries. Obviously, the developing countries, it must be higher. Uh, 7 million disabling complications due to surgery, 1 million deaths per year due to surgery. The most important thing is nearly 50% of those are preventable, and that puts a huge responsibility on us. It's These are preventable. Further, more than 50% of all, all healthcare-related adverse events are surgical in nature. So that's put a huge responsibility on surgeons and surgical care providers. And 75% of these occur in operation theater. That doesn't mean that don't get away with the idea that surgeons are terrible fellows, anesthetists are dangerous fellows, uh, don't go to operation theater. It's not, it's actually the nature of surgical care happens in operation theater. All of you understand that uh, most invasive type of medical care. And it's very complex. So many people, anesthetists, surgeons, uh, paramedics, nurses, everybody has to involve and it's a real teamwork. And what happens in operation theater is, is a high risk environment. It has been equated to aviation industry and uh, perhaps uh, nuclear reactors. So that's why this checklist and safety measures are very important in operation theater setup. Uh, it has been further complicated by advanced technology and the complexity of delivery of health, uh, surgery. And that has led to being more complex as well as more uh, error prone. Let's take a simple example. We all used to do open cholecystectomies. Then came the lab cholic system. Till this learning curve improves, uh, quite a lot of common bile duct injuries were reported. So that's, there are benefits to the patient as well as uh, risk to the patient. So that's, and at the same time, the society's expectation, the modern society is quite knowledgeable 
they don't expect any errors they need perfect error free healthcare delivery so that's a very complex situation complexity and the advance in technology make it more error prone and the people expect error free care <clears throat> this has been already referred i will not go into details uh, only to mention that uh, something has to happen in america for the world to act i mean we have a very good example i think it's fortunate or unfortunate i don't know the 911 and then the whole world started led by america thinking differently of terrorism uh, now this is another incident uh, as previous speakers mentioned instead of medicine put this report in 1999 uh, i don't know sometimes i think this may be exaggerated version 44 to 98000 patient die each year in us due to medical errors medical and surgical errors which anyway has produced some good results because then they influenced the who to uh, work and already discuss how it happens in the history and again another thing noted was high error rates occur in icus ots and aie departments the reasons are obvious then another good thing i don't know whether it's a good thing or bad thing surgeons uh, or surgical care was taken as a public health issue by the who usually who has no respect for surgeons uh, and it only public health and uh, in cds and except trauma trauma was drawing who attention because it was the increasing number but otherwise so this uh, gave some surgeon some chance to come into the picture uh, for good or bad reasons uh, then two aspects as i mentioned earlier my focus will be mainly on safety of surgical care the who the global initiative was safe surgery saves lives which was the second global patient safety challenge first one was of hand washing i think kushalani knows about it and then uh, the mal distribution of surgical services so who found out that 30% of the world population receiving 75% of major operations like most things uh, a small percentage of people enjoy the best uh, things in the world whether we like it or not that's the reality uh, so surgical care also is this so you can't talk about surgical safety unless you talk about availability and accessibility of surgical care to the needy people so that's a problem because of that there are some global initiatives one on uh, surgical care and <coughs> guidelines of essential trauma care uh, about access and quality and then came the lancet commission on global surgery 2014 uh, with the slogan global surgery 2030 so that's on so we we also had some things from the college of surgeons we were asked to submit some uh, data uh, with that so things are happening and surgeons and surgical care has got got into the who global picture due to this then uh, as already mentioned this uh, world awareness led to have a, a launching what is called world alliance of patient safety in 2004 and uh, they declared up to now i think three uh, global patient safety challenges first one was in 2005 clean care is safe care which is a very simple hand washing thing i think kushalani and them uh, involved in that introducing it here and the results were unbelievable so they say that was one of the best invent inventions in the century or something which from point of view of cost effectiveness then came the second one is safe surgery saves lives that was in 2010 i think recently uh, they have declared a third one is medication without harm so that's how the who gets involved in patient safety i think these uh, things have been already defined but uh, from surgical point of view uh, it's sometimes these words confuse and gives wrong impressions 
Now, when you say surgical complication, it is any deviation from the normal post-operative course, which is unintended, undesirable, and direct result of surgery. And one example, if I say, is if you are going to do a appendicectomy and if you damage the cecum and end up with the fecal fistula or something, that's a very clear surgical complication. Similarly, surgical site infection is also considered a surgical complication. It's not always the fault of the surgeon, but it's considered as this. Then adverse event is slightly broader. Any unintended injury caused by medical or surgical management other than the underlying condition of the patients. Patients disease ending up with the complication that is not considered an adverse event under patient safety issues. Example is patient admitted for appendicectomy. After or before appendicectomy, he goes to the washroom and slips and falls and get a head injury. Now that is an adverse event, but has it's not considered a surgical complication. So like that we can uh, have some definition. There is an overlap. Then few other. So what is a Fortunately, they, when they, the WHO talks about, they talk about medical errors, they don't use the word surgical. So, but we have to men they say medical, it includes surgical errors as well, because surgical errors are more dramatic. Uh, it could be either outcome dependent, what happened to the patient, or process dependent, but better to have a process dependent one or both. Uh, one good thing I came across, is an act of omission or commission, which has been already discussed by the previous speakers in planning or execution that contributes or could contribute. The word, the important words, could contribute. That means near misses are also included to an unintended result. So if you have a process dependent, irrespective of the outcome, uh, errors can lead to adverse event or errors can the patient is lucky or the system is there that they pick up uh, uh, these things before it cause harm to the patient are called near misses so close calls. But don't all adverse events, only some adverse events are due to errors, not all due to errors. So there could be adverse events like fall in the toilet or something is an uh, adverse event, but not due to error. Uh, then some data from uh, study done in Netherlands shows that nearly 70% of the errors lead to hardly any consequence to the patient. They are called near misses. So from the patient's point of view, it is good. But if you just ignore them, the next one will be a disaster. So that group has to be recognized and investigated and learned from them. So that is the important thing. So again, uh, this was discussed in year misses. I won't go into detail. Uh, the sentinel event, that is important. Sentinel event is an unanticipated event in a healthcare setting that results in a death or serious physical or psychological injury to a patient, not related to the natural cause of the patient's illness. Again, it's always directly uh, related to surgical care or medical care. Usually due to errors of commission or omission. Uh, again, all sentinel events may not be due to errors. Uh, it could be only a tip of the iceberg, but whether we like it or not, sentinel events will be reported. Even if you don't report some media fellow will uh, get this thing and that report may or may not be accurate, but they are reported to the public in a different format. So that's our responsibility. Before it happens that way, we should have a system of mandated reporting and investigating so that the truth comes out. Uh, then another, I don't think this word was mentioned. Uh, again, in literature, we talk about never events. Again, a good uh, grounds for media people to thrive. So they like, in our Sri Lankan media, they, they thrive on disasters. 
they keep on repeating they show the cctv footage and irrespective of the effect of the victims of that they keep on showing that how the patient dies how the vehicle runs so so these are absolutely uh, gems for media people so never events are errors which should never have happened basically so they are mostly sentinel events but little more serious than even sentinel events in surgery uh, i have just listed five things come under this category surgery on wrong body parts even in this developed world these things happen even in united states these things happen so it's it's uh, unbelievable how these things happen but it happens surgery on the wrong patient i have experienced this not by me but one of my patients was operated by another surgeon before i arrived at the scene in a private hospital fortunately not operated anesthetized uh, before we operated uh, some clever uh, sister in the theater uh, recognized it that that was not the way i was doing things and she has asked and then you know, sorted out so these things can happen to anybody uh, wrong surgery on on a patient completely wrong so it has happened in a private hospital a patient who came for a uh, i think he he came for a hemorrhoidectomy or something uh, he had underwent a av fistula created under local anesthesia so these are not exaggerations has actually happened uh because the patient did know he would have thought that this was uh, cannulation done before surgery and he has better than he was ended up with because there was another patient who was for peritoneal dial sorry uh, hemodialysis uh, getting this so these things happen uh, unintended retention of foreign bodies happens intra or immediate post op death in as a one patient so normal healthy patient if they die within that period so those considered the events which should not happen so into that list you can add unsafe administration of blood products in surgical practice sometimes in surgery also use medication sometimes medication errors in surgery result in serious consequences so that uh, covers that lot then you can classify surgical errors in surgery in different ways errors in technique error in judgment delay in diagnosis like that goes on and errors in communication then another way of classifying it is uh, fixing the responsibility failure of an individual x like maybe a genuine human error or maybe a negligence or maybe incompetence any of those things failure of the system failure of equipment or all of the above then if you analyze when you go into the root cause analysis you can call that whole incident as a few accident or it may be related to incompetence the person was not competent to do it because of that so there may be multiple factors involved but the main reason is the incompetence of the person who was doing it or maybe a severe negligence so this is where our medical council comes in and uh, i am sad to say that i don't think uh, in sri lankan history to my knowledge uh, there were no reported cases of sheer negligence where slmc took action so that's that talks very good healthcare in our country compared to uk they must be every year they probably have several people removing their registration Sri Lanka has never done it. Done once, I think, one person only for six months. Uh, that's also funny. Six months. I don't know how he <laughs> improves after six months. So this is our medical council. So then uh, comes to this uh, second uh, 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 slogan: a global patient safety challenge in 2000. Safe surgery saves life. and they the working group 
under WHO recognize four main areas uh, due to uh, why the surgical say, uh, patient safety is compromised in surgery. It's at that time not recognized. Now it has improved a lot. Not recognized as a significant problem. Uh, positive of basic data, surgical volume outcome still in Sri Lanka, obviously, we don't have accurate data. I'll come to that later. Uh, another interesting thing is existing safety practices, which has been there over years, has not been used reliably. For instance, giving prophylactic antibiotics. They just take it for granted and it's given at any given time. So simple things like that has been ignored in most situations. Uh, and then, of course, complexity of the surgical care. Now, we have our own experience of lack of data on surgery and outcomes. We have a very positive thing. All of us know what happened to maternal mortality, how it drastically dropped when the surveillance and the maternal mortality reviews were introduced. Uh, so that's a good example we have if we can. So we have in our college, we suggested that at least uh, uh, surgical mortality should be that should be a similar mechanism to investigate these things and find the root causes and these things so far it has not happened uh, then i mentioned that failure of uh, existing safety measures not implemented antibiotic prophylaxis uh, monitoring standards of an uh, anesthetic complications and the monitors are taken i have seen myself when the pulse ox, the simple thing, pulse oximeter was not uh, giving a wrong record, either they should switch it off and they don't do that. They just say, uh, they, they ignore uh, When you ask why that is giving a wrong, no, no, that is not working. So you can't accept that. So, so we have our lab reports also like that. You get some terrible lab reports, uh, then you leave it aside and carry on and say, these are not correct. I mean, so that's that's the so that has been there. Then uh, this working group had uh, five steps strategy to work uh, improve the safe uh, surgical safety uh, promotion of surgical safety as a global public health, which has happened after this uh, uh, second uh, thing worldwide publicity, provide accurate information and data to all healthcare workers. The third one is defining minimum set of measures. I'll discuss that a little later. Uh, vital statistics for surveillance in surgery. Identify simple set of surgical safety standards that are applicable in all countries and settings and are compiled in the checklist. That is how this uh, WHO patient safety checklist came into existence. They incorporated all these uh, objectives into this checklist, which is very effective. Then dissemination of this knowledge worldwide after pilot testing. So that is happening. So 10 essential uh, objectives for surgery, already mentioned general things. Now this is more specific to surgical safety. Correct patient site procedure, safe anesthetic method, methods, ensure adequate airway, recognize and prepare for high blood loss, anticipate before it happens, avoid allergic reactions. So these are the areas identified as uh, uh, risk problems, minimal risk of surgical site infection, prevent retention of instrument sponges uh, in surgical wounds identify and handle surgical specimens properly. Now that's another area. I have had very bad experience when you take a lymph node biopsy for a suspected malignancy and you wait for two weeks. After two weeks, you checked, specimen is missing. Once it was reported that the uh, ants or rats have eaten the specimen. Uh, another situation, specimen could not be traced. It was entered in the nurses notes, but lab denies that they received the, so these things should not happen, because this is a disaster for the patient. So, so there are safeguards to prevent that happening. 
effective communication among team members, surgical surveillance, structure, process, and outcomes, all that data should be available and updated. So this is the, those are the 10 things. And this, uh, I don't go into details, but uh, surgical safety checklist, I'm sure it is implemented here. So um, all of you have seen this. Uh, and WHO gave uh, permission, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Sridharan was fully involved in that. Uh, gave, and they have changed the uh, list to suit our conditions. And it came as uh, sign in, time out, and sign out. Uh, so now that has been changed uh, to uh, this thing. That time out was a concept where they practice in sports. Uh, they stop everything and go to a corner and discuss and come back. So same thing happens in the theater. You are supposed to stop everything before you make the incision. After the patient is anesthetized, then everybody is identified. I'm sure all of you know that. Uh, so these 10 objectives were, so this is our Sri Lankan uh, surgical safety checklist by the Ministry of Health. Uh, so I think it's slowly picking up, it's being implemented. Uh, this section is added by our ministry, the patient data section. Uh, so, wrong patient site procedure. Uh, thousand five hundred to two thousand five hundred wrong patient sites surgery per year a few years ago. So you can imagine with all this litigation and all these issues in United States, if it is happening. Uh, still, uh, what can happen in any other country? Uh, so these things are all addressed in this simple uh, checklist. Uh, I won't go into details. There are three steps in universal protocol of identifying the patient and the correct site. Verification, marking the site on the patient. Uh, that In the tech checklist, that time out, you again check the site and the patient. So, so there are three steps this is uh, done. So the marking the site, if it is a unilateral situation, should be done by the surgeon or a senior representative, especially in cases of involving uh, multiple structures laterally, arrow with the permanent marker. So uh, still, however much we say, this doesn't happen to our satisfaction. So then the, the other uh, section uh, where the objectives one to five, six are covered. Uh, prevention of surgical site sepsis includes this uh, checklist business of uh, uh, ensuring uh, prophylaxis given when it is appropriate and the uh, hand washing and various procedures recommended by the WHO. Uh, then the third section is uh, sign out or before patient leaves the operation theater. Do the table, patient is taken off the bed, uh, the specimen is checked and the operation is checked and the sp uh, sponge and the instrument count is checked, all that. So all that objectives are covered. So this is what uh, WHO wants uh, in uh, national level surgical vital statistics, number of surgical procedures performed per 100,000 population a year. I think the ministry probably has that figure now. Uh, number of operation theaters per thousand population, I think that is also available. I, I didn't have the updated version, so because of that I, number of surgeons per 100,000 per, it's a very variable uh, figure. I don't think you can fix, but every day somebody is leaving and somebody is coming and it's very dynamic. Number of anesthetic professionals, day of surgery mortality rates, post-operative in-hospital mortality rate. So these are the, and in addition to that, surgical site infection rates, and they have device and other thing called surgical abgasco, like obstetrics uh, based on estimated blood loss, low, lowest mean arterial pressure during surgery, lowest heart rate during surgery, correspond with the post-op outcome and the abgasco. So these are the data we are supposed to have and this checklist was tested in eight cities and uh, found to be uh, 
uh, found to be very effective nearly to one third to half uh, reduction in the uh, rates of infections and complications found in those cities. Uh, therefore, WHO recommends it to all countries. And uh, take the Sri Lankan situation, I'm happy to say we always talk about negative things. I think this is one area we can talk positively because we are, thanks to these three gentlemen uh, here, uh, led by uh, Dr. Sridharan, I think I can remember when he became the director of the first uh, healthcare quality and patient safety. I'm sure all of you are aware that there is a directorate behind the Castle Street Hospital, uh, and he is the current director. So a lot of things have happened to my satisfaction. I'm also a person who don't, doesn't get satisfied easily, but uh, I think Sri Lankan context in this field, I think we have progressed a lot and a surgical safety checklist was introduced. Implementation is, I think all of us are responsible. Uh, main private hospitals have introduced for a different purpose because they wanted it for accreditation purposes. SLMA subcommittee was active. I don't know, uh, not so active now. Uh, guidelines for health professional curricula has been introduced. All the nursing uh, courses in undergraduates, uh, patient safety is a topic. All of, I'm sure all the medical students know about patient safety now. Postgraduate surgical trainees, everybody who comes to our exams knows about because this is uh, several years ago. First time a question was set for MD trainees, 90% of them fail. I must thank the late uh, Dr. Sarosha Gunawardhan, who is the one who said that question. There were a lot of criticism for him, but he did the national service by introducing that question. Not a difficult question because none of the surgical trainees have ever uh, thought or studied about patient safety and 90% fail. So now things are, no surgical trainee will come to exams without knowing about the concept of patient safety, which is good. Then adverse event reporting was introduced. Then uh, as the last section, I will say, uh, how to ensure surgical safety. Obviously we need safe surgeons, safe surgical team, safe surgical environment and safety aware patients and society. One might argue that number four should be on the top because if you have a safety aware patients and society, everything else will fall in line. The surgeons will, will have to survive in this environment. So anyway, so we are supposed to produce safe surgeons. I was also involved in PGIM with this. Uh, we have a responsibility to select trainable guys to do surgery. And they should have knowledge and skills and attitudes suitable for a surgeon, uh, a safe surgeon. Competency is a different issue, safe surgeon. Uh, then we have a certification process. That's not enough. They should have a continuous professional development and revalidation, which has been resisted by a lot of people. They tried Several people, SLMA, tried to introduce this uh, revalidation, especially surgeons. Uh, I think if you may have passed out 10 years ago with some skills, but they are no longer valid now. Uh, things have changed. Uh, but then the another important thing, robust regulations. We have a college of surgeons. We are supposed to have our internal regulations, which is not happening to my satisfaction. Then SLMC, which has some sort of more external regulation, both I mentioned is not doing their job. Uh, so, so this is how a safe surgeon so safe surgeon should be a competent person with knowledge, skills, and attitude and should be updated. Uh, he should uh, be a team member, teamwork skills, including effective communication. This is an area which we need further development because this era that surgeons are all powerful, uh, strict hierarchy that nobody questions surgeons. Uh, this thing in the operation theater is gone. Now they are all more or less equal members of the team. Uh, so, 
Now, when we also have gone through, when a senior professor operates, if he is going to make a stupid mistake, uh, no assisting house service or registrar will uh, stop him and say that. So this happens. So that, that's gone. So that's why this uh, teamwork and communication is important. Leadership skills and loyalty to the institution. Safe surgical team. I think that's obvious. Uh, safe surgical environment. So all this surgical care taking place should be safe physically and uh, should be free of potential hazards. I already mentioned safety culture, equipment malfunction, unsafe beds, slippery flow, all those things. And then this was also mentioned open policy. Uh, it's called open disclose disclosure policy. I think some private hospitals have that. Uh, when the patient enters, they know they, these things are given. So if there is a mistake or error happens, that will be openly discussed by a senior person with the patient and there's a protocol to follow. So these things uh, improve, I think government hospitals also, we can do it. Uh, so these are all basically accidents. So we should be able to openly discuss these things. Uh, then I have put a question mark about the safety of your patient society. Even the WHO has recognized that uh, litigation has can have a positive as well as negative effect. So the way you take it. So if you just try to practice uh, defensive medicine, then it may not be good for the patient. So there are issues like that. Finally, role of surgical care providers. Already it, this was discussed by the previous workers in general terms. In surgery, to be aware of the gravity of the problem, which we know new developments to improve the situation. So you should be aware of what's happening, the surgical checklist and all that. Engage in effective teamwork, uh, help to implement surgical checklist if it is not happening in some hospitals because when you keep on doing it, nobody sees any results of it. It is hidden. So, some so it may have prevented hundreds of disasters, but it is not reported. So therefore people after some time uh, tend to ignore it's a waste of time. What is the point? We are so busy and I have heard people telling this. Uh, then as already mentioned, move away from the name, blame, shame culture, which we are very good at. Uh, to report, study, learn. That doesn't mean that individual responsibility can be taken away. Like everything in this country is due to Adhirajavadin, so that's not the concept. We also have to take response. If the same person is doing the same mistake several times, he should be removed from the system. But most of the time, system is at fault. Contribute to adverse event reporting, maintain proper records. So these are the responsibilities of us surgeons and other surgical care providers. So that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ranjan Dias. Uh, uh, and then now the final speaker is uh, Dr. Alan Dwight, uh, who is, uh, uh, I, I, I won't be, I've been detailed, but he is the current uh, director in quality and safety. And also he has other responsibilities, but uh, due to the time constraint, I'm just uh, inviting you to uh, give the brief uh, sort of outline of what we have already done uh, in Sri Lanka related to this topic. Thank you. Which Chris? Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, uh, my thanks to Dr. Krishna Indahatilka, President of the Clinical Society of Sri Jamnapur General Hospital. Uh, 
Then, of course, Dr. Vinya Ratna, who is the president of the SLMA. It's a joint meeting with the clinical society. So thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, share some of the things that uh, we are doing at the Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety uh, in, you know, to improve the system. You have heard now how things can go wrong uh, and that how it's often due to system errors, not due to patient errors. Then I also have to thank the other panelists because uh, they are my uh, teachers. Professor Ranjan Das, sorry, sir, we always call you prof, can't go to doctor. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Karandagoda, who is our guru again, uh, he started this when I was a young MO and uh, Casa Street was the place to learn it. Uh, and that was because of him. And I have gone to him when I was a young MO and I was appointed to Lady Ridgeway Hospital. And I was asked to do a uh, quality productivity program there as a young MO. Not, uh, there was no quality management units at that time. There was just, I was in charge of the health education unit. So I was training staff in all the categories of staff. And the management also uh, discovered that mm -hmm. and ultimately pushed mm -hmm. me into admin. That's how I ended up becoming an administrator. But I, my, the learning ground was at that stage at LRH because I also found to my uh, great amazement that small steps in improving quality had a big impact on the system. You know, and that is really what pushed me also to take this up because I was challenged by uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Samarage, another guru of mine, who mm -hmm. came in uh, one day to visit the LRH mm -hmm. and told me, you have, to do a, you have to start a productivity program. I said, no, sir, I can't do that. I have enough work. And I was very upset, actually. Then he said, no, no, Alan, we'll help you. So, in fact, we started it at the Lady Ridgeway Children's Hospital. Uh, Professor Ranjan Dias was there at that time. Uh, we started with the surgical wing, just the surgical wing. This was way back in the early 2000s. Uh, but my initiation in was uh, through the health information unit of the ministry. Uh, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Shantilal uh, who, was, uh, who came and gave a um, sort of an introduction to 5S, the 5S concept. You know, that is, that's okay. That's a, that's a start. That's just house, good housekeeping. It's not quality. Now, some people mistake this 5S for quality. It is only the, the ground. You're basically setting the foundation to uh, improve the, the system. You have to have some amount of, you know, things in place before you can build on it. So, but I, when I understood that concept, it was not just for the hospital, right? It is for any place. It is even for your own home. You know, that type of uh, 5S concepts, because it's a Japanese concept. Uh, uh, Dr. Karnagod also started with that. And then we moved on to total quality management, continuous quality improvement, all those yeah, other tools that we were using. But we started with that, right? I, I mean, I remember him very well telling, uh, it should actually start in a lady's handbag, right? Because if you look at the handbag, uh, <laughs> you can't find anything in a hurry, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, but it was very practical things, you know, very, very practical things that they were showing. And I realized, that, you know, these are even quality improvement is not about uh, cost. It's not about, you know, putting money in. You can do small things which are not, in fact, quality shouldn't be involving tremendous cost. In fact, it should reduce cost because the system becomes more efficient, you know, and you, you reduce the, the, the mistakes you make, right? That's very important. You must, you must, we have to learn from our mistakes. The uh, previous speakers also highlighted that. Because you shouldn't make the same mistake twice. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine. I remember him visiting him when he was an intern. I was a junior then. And he had a nice uh, board on his table, on his desk. He said, don't make the same mistake twice. Find new ones. Find new mistakes. Yes, because if you're repeating the same mistake, means you haven't learned from the first mistake. You have to find new ones and learn from that also. Don't keep repeating it. And share it with the others. That's the whole idea. Share it with the others, this mistake I made, yes. So that we don't hide it. Because how can the others benefit? Because if you make a mistake, somebody else also can make the same mistake somewhere else. So you have to, that's the whole concept of share the idea. Then the other person also learns from your mistake. Right? There, there, is, there, there is no need for this name, name, blame, shame game. It hasn't worked. As Sir said, it didn't work. I mean, we are having, you know, investigation te teams running around trying to catch people you know, doing the wrong thing. In fact, I think we should catch people doing the right thing and encourage them. Right? 
that's what the system should be doing but we are we have been trying you know sending these, these things and they are doing an inquiry and the whole purpose of the inquiry is to name somebody and try and put some disciplinary action often of course i have found to my in my experience the disciplinary action is you have promoted them somewhere else you have taken them out of there and they go and do the same thing in that new place also and as i said you know that so the our systems haven't you know addressed the, the root cause sometimes we continue to you know perpetuate the same system so we have, we need change we need change so the directorate and i have to thank my staff at the directorate for these slides it's a bit theoretical right but i'll i'll go through them i hope i don't bore you uh, because it's really what what we what steps we have taken over the years i am not the sole you know uh, uh, although i presently occupy that post by the way i am on my way out i'm i'm i have actually had to take my leave prior to retirement because i was given another post in january of this year at uh, the national authority is there something seems to be knocking no i hear a knocking sound okay all right <laughs> okay so uh, i am actually on my way out because i was given another post uh, at the national authority on tobacco and al alcohol and uh, maybe i shouldn't touch the podium okay um, but it's still knocking anyway uh, so i can't do three jobs because i was covering senior assistant secretary medical service for the last three years then the appointed the director of healthcare quality and safety but anyway let me let me get into the theory and then i'm sure we'll have i hope we'll have a little time we'll have a discussion as well uh, uh, where you can ask your questions so the national focal point for healthcare quality and safety is uh, is the directorate of healthcare quality and safety some people don't know there is such a directorate it's hidden at the back of castle street hospital a very nice place very quiet it's between uh, the golf course and the uh, and the hospital and of course the golf course and then the crematorium and the cemetery was on the other side and uh, so i said we are always between life and death so you know the the births are taking place in castle street and you're dying on the other side of the road uh, because it's on model farm road the back gate and that's the closest to the healthcare quality and safety directorate uh, actually those who are in the quality management unit of the hospitals know that we exist but sometimes others don't know that there is actually a directorate of healthcare quality safety under the ministry of health right because it, the founder director was dr sridharan and uh, after that there have been a succession of others whom i i i am i you know have a debt of gratitude to because they have all taken it forward right and uh, unfortunately i came at the tail end of my career and i was i have been there for a little over a year uh, but I, i i can't continue because i you know they keep they don't they don't appoint people they keep asking you to take on more and more responsibilities and, and it's it becomes very very hard because you can't do justice to anything when you are appointed to cover three posts so this uh, this directorate works under the direct uh, ddg medical services at the present time dr lal panapitia uh, ms1 so uh, there is a structure there in you know and it's according to the particular plans that we have made that these are but there are three uh, uh, sorry there are seven key result areas right Uh, that we that we the activities are under one is the customer patient satisfaction and experience then you know and that is customer focused we have always have to understand that we have to become patient centric patient centered for a very very long time it has been doctor centric right and and we you can't blame the doctors entirely because our patients come with the idea that we know best right so it's a very prescriptive but unfortunately that has to change we are they are really to guide them to make the the right choices it's their choice it's their life and unless you satisfy the patient how can you improve quality because at the end of the day quality is measured by the recipient of that service not by us we can evaluate we can certainly evaluate the quality of our service but at the end of the day the, at the bottom line it is the patient who tells you i have received quality right when they walk out of our of the gate of our institution they are the people who judge us whether the service has been has given them quality or not so there has obviously leadership governance and systems involved right as you say have you pointed out the iom report basically uh, said there are system errors often individuals make errors even if they are fatigued and all why they are overworked right so all those because the system hasn't prevented it and if you go into the theory if you you look at uh, professor james reason's uh, work he will tell you that we can have in place what they call the swiss cheese model where you have you know checks so that you don't get this going through many 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 different checkpoints at some point it will stop there right 
so that's that's the whole idea of developing uh, these uh, governance and systems to because you can facilitate and uh, minim and and improve quality by minimizing the mistakes then there is clinical effectiveness right because you have to promote evidence based ethically accepted clinical practices right and that is that gives the best possible outcome for the patient then of course risk management and safety because we mitigate risks so like like medication procedures there can there are many risks involved by the way you know i mean this is a complex system as they were saying this is a very complex system our health system this is not a simple linear process like an assembly line each person doing his bit right this is somebody else's output is somebody else's input you know and you are dependent on that so it's complex it's not simple and it's highly risky this is a risky business we are doing a risky business right uh, not only for the, uh, the external customers the internal customers was at risk so it understand that as well and that the quality has to come for you know in a totality that's why we call it total quality right because it's in total that this has to be given so enabling culture is very important you know that's very uh, very very easy to say you know the enabling culture but it's not easy to change in fact my uh, my research when i was doing my msc under dr samarge subhishan was on uh, you know uh, uh, trying to diagnose the climate you see it's slightly different from the culture the culture is the the values the beliefs the you know the the, the traditions that have come as a result of that right the, the values but the but the uh, climate is how you do things in an institution now you it's hard to change the culture as you well know right it's very hard to change culture because that's been there people say no that's that's the way right it's hard to change their values and beliefs no that doesn't happen easily but the climate you can change how you do things around it, it beca- you can also put that and make it institutionalize them this is how we do it around here so when anyone new comes in they will say ah maybe i can't do it this is the way it's done like this there is no other way to do it so if you do that and you put it in the, the, if the right thing is being done then no one can come and try and do the wrong thing you enable them to do the right thing because this is how it's done in this system right that is the climate so climate you might be able to change and then over time gradually the culture also will change anyway that's that was my my research there and that's why i have a passion for quality because from the time i was a, a young mo and having been influenced by such people i i i thought that this was something that really adds value to our system so of course you have to develop the staff right and we have high turnovers that's the other other downside of the medical system we have turnover you train somebody they are there today gone tomorrow now they are more going than now coming right so we are we are in a very very desperate situation right but staff development and well being you have to look at as well when you look at quality why if your internal customer right is not satisfied how is he going to produce quality if he is unhappy it's going to affect the way he works right and it's true right we have to address those issues in fact i think uh, dr karangura must be knowing this there was a japanese team that came to evaluate our our systems they said your systems are all fairly good they are in place they are you know they are saying so quality uh, your know, quality processes are there the problem is quality person quality person missing so that also we have to think about you know the quality person also has to be developed you know who thinks quality who wants to do wants to produce quality excellence in what they do that is important you can have all these systems in place and we are putting a lot of things in place and we are continuing to do it but if the person who's doing it doesn't have that quality you know and want to have that commitment as you are talking about then we are sadly going to fall short right so research for quality improvement and patient safety that is absolutely essential you know we are not we are in a dynamic environment we are not in a stagnant environment every day new things are happening especially in a, you know in a, in the medical and surgical fields there's always new things. that's why we are having to constantly revise our guidelines we have to revise our guidelines we have to revise the indicators right so we are constantly in consensus the directorate always is having consultations with the various stakeholders because we have to improve it is never static it's a cyclic thing right it keeps on having to go again revise look at it again check are we uh, is this the best keep on improving so the next day is better than today right okay 
So the availability of a national policy and strategic plan is there. We developed it, the, the National Policy on Healthcare Quality in 2015 when Dr. Sridharan was at the directorate, as I told you. Uh, by the way, this is one of the youngest directorates of the ministry, yeah? because it started where it's the last that was started and it still remains the youngest. But the policy was revised and along with the strategic plan, uh, we, uh, we, the strategic plan runs from 2021 to 2025. And both these documents were launched last year on the World Patient Safety Day. So uh, this was launched, uh, the medication safety also was launched, the National Action Plan in 2021. We developed it through a multi-stakeholder environment. For that, I'm very grateful to the University of Colombo also and Professor Priyadarshan Galapati, happens to be a batchmate of mine. I'm very happy to have worked with her in, in close collaboration. And in line with the four domains and the three flagships that WHO has identified, we have uh, produced this guidance document for planning and implementation of medication safety initiatives in the country at, uh, at policy as well as institutional level. Then, of course, there is the quality management units. Now, they are the institutional focal points for quality, right? So ideally, you should have a medical officer and other staff, a nursing officer, maybe someone else as well, right, uh, to help. And uh, that has to be the focus for the taking forward the quality work in an institution. So uh, in, in, you know, we have established it in many of the base hospitals and above, 154 of them, and in regional uh, or director of health officers, health service officers. So the QMUs were established uh, through a 2013 circular from the ministry. And... Uh, they are responsible for improving the quality, healthcare quality and safety in those respective institutions. Now, ideally, the if there is a deputy director in the institution, it comes under his purview. He should closely supervise it because sometimes the head of the institution can't look at all of these different, different units. So we expect that the deputy director will specifically monitor what is happening, right? Because you need something like that. Even with work improvement teams, you, there has to be a leader, right? Uh, now we want to change the name to Quality Circus because it's not just about work, right? The improvements that can happen, it's not only work, quality is a much larger concept. So uh, there has to be a leader. There may need to be a secretary if you have a good quality circle. You need to, might have to have a treasurer if there's finance involved. But that, there has to be someone that monitors these quality circles as well. That's why initially we were saying there should be a monitoring team. What I did at LRH was all the WIT leaders became part of the monitoring team. And then, of course, that's on top, the steering committee, right? And that is made of the top management because sometimes authorization approvals have to be given for some of the activities of the quality circles in the, at the at unit level, right? So uh, the QMUs at RDHS office are overall responsible for supervising their, their, their uh, quality improvement at the provincial hospitals, including the primary healthcare institutions, medical care institutions. Uh, then there's a coordination between this national focal and point, the directorate and the quality management unit. So we, we have maintained regular and frequent uh, coordination with them. Uh, we have uh, me, me, meet consultative meetings that are held right throughout the year on planning and implementing these quality initiatives. They provide their inputs. It's a give and take, right? We are not, if they, if they you see, the thing is this, sometimes it has to be a bottom-up approach. They have to tell you their issues and we have to look at it and try and find, find out what is best to be done, right? Because it can't be just a top-down approach because we don't know whether it will work or not in your context. So that's, that's just always been the way we have taken it forward. So training is provided for the quality management unit staff. I know the director of this hospital also spoke to me early in the year and saying uh, we should do a, and he had a large number of staff he wanted to train. I thought it's best to come to the institution and do it rather than invite you because we conduct training of trainers and master trainers programs on a regular basis and invite nominations. But that's only a few that we can take from each institution. There are so many institutions that want training, especially because they have new people coming into the system. So training is provided by the directorate and in order to continue this quality improvement and also clinical audits. Now that is another important aspect that again, not done well enough in our system, clinical audits. Right? So we are promoting that. We are training people on clinical audits. In fact, we will have one on clinical governance because actually clinical governance through clinical audits. And we are, we are quarterly when we review, we ask them to present their clinical audits. In fact, I'll, I'll describe it later. We are hoping to have a national level 
um, you know, a convention where we'll highlight some of the really good audits. And for that, we need the support of the consultants. So what we have done is we, we, have, we have actually, we are liaising with the SLMA to do this work because they also do have training programs on clinical governance and a separate committee. So what we have decided to do is because we are getting funded, we're going to get funded for this activity, Global Fund. And so why go, we thought it is best to do it with the SLMA in conjunction with the SLMA because then we can get the consultants also on board. Because really they have to, you know, uh, push it not at all the clinical units should start auditing their work. Unless we do that, how can we know whether we have attained standards? Right? So we are pushing that as well. And I hope in this year that we will get approval. First of all, we have to get approval by the ministry because of the money will then be utilized by the SLMA. So all those approvals need, and that takes time, unfortunately, quite a long time. Uh, so correspondence is maintained to inform the, the QMUs on these new developments. We monitor the performance uh, quarterly and uh, the, they share their best practices. We have given them a format uh, of how to do this presentation. Uh, we give them about 10 minutes. Usually, sometimes they take much longer than that to present. So it takes a whole day, sometimes to review one region. And so, but we do this on a regular, quarterly. Every, qu every quarter, we review the hospitals from base hospitals and above. So the, they, they, they participate uh, in that review and uh, give us their, their feedback. They don't have to present everything because some of them are just data. And we, 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 we do keep a database. So the QME is also participating in this World Patient Safety Day. Well, as Dr. Sridharan said, that falls on September 17th. Uh, this year, it happens to be a Sunday. So we'll have it on the 15th and 16th, uh, two days, because we're going to have a national annual convention along with that to highlight, say, good clinical audits, research, best practices, so that, uh, you know, I mean, we have to encourage people. I don't think our system does, does, does it well enough because we don't seem to understand that people need to be encouraged in our system. You know, for a very long time, I didn't even know, but there is a there is actually a form in our in our in our you know, under the ministry where there is a commendation can be given by the secretary. I, I never realized it till suddenly one day I got one <laughs> because I had helped with the preparing of a report for parliament, right? Under under DDG planning. And I was pretty shocked. He says, you know, thank you very much for you know doing this out of you know, because I was not attached to the ministry at that time, but they called me in to help them uh, produce this uh, uh, document very quickly. But there's a commendation form. Now that goes into your personal file. Who will not like that? No? And I think even the, in the hospitals, it should be done, right? If a letter goes from your director into your personal file saying, we are commending of the work you're doing. I mean, okay, it's not, it's not financial gain, but it is something that goes into your permanent record. Isn't that, I mean, anybody is happy with that. They are happy with that. They they encouraged by that. They might do more, right? So, but these are the type of things that you know. I think you know we have to look at uh, when it comes to you know improving our motivation and you know while we train people. So there's capacity building, right? Uh, we do this. I told you we do various training: three-day training for continuous quality improvement, two-day training for clinical audits. And uh, we have resource people from various, as you know, we can draw in uh, the resource, uh, the faculty from various sources. So we do that. And uh, we also now are looking at expanding the training to the preventive sector. And it's about it because sometimes we, the preventive sector, you know, uh, got neglected in this process. And sometimes they haven't improved their quality. And we have looked at basically the, the you know, the, the, the curative sector. You know, and we do need to improve the quality. And by the way, this is not only the, the government sector. It has to include the private sector as well. Of course, they have, they have generally you know, done on their own, right? Like Lanka hospitals, where Dr. Karanda Goda was. You know, they, they took it up. And they, I mean, I think it was personally his uh, drive that took that forward. But you know, that's where you need leadership. Someone who catches that vision and goes with it. You know? Walks the talk. You know, you have to go the way, show the way, you know, and that's, that's very important. So that's why, you know, you need good leadership. So you have to, and because it engages also many, many, many stakeholders, health can't do this alone, right? You know that very well. We have to have multi-stakeholder consultation in, in order to do this, to implement and to, uh, you know, all these initiatives require lots of different people who will have a say, you know, have an input, you know, into this. So it's not only the Ministry of Health, by the way. Right? It's not only ministry, our stakeholders, we have to call some of the other ministries 
because they also their activities affect us right so education ministry comes in sometimes and so many other other you know ministries that play a role you know whether it's agriculture or whatever you know we are talking about things that ultimately if if they are not so on board we can't achieve it right so it, then it just becomes a theoretical exercise so there are other ministries uh, professional colleges of course the academia the patient groups by the way patient groups have now have to take up a significant role that is another area that in our system we we have not developed well there aren't enough patients groups we we initially started once i remember when i was in the ministry we called some of these people and the media to a meeting uh, under a former minister and we, they, you know they, they were trying to develop a patient rights charter and all that but we don't have a very strong lobby among our patients who will stand up and fight for some other uh changes that are needed fortunately this time the world patient safety day the theme is uh, uh patient and family engagement right now they are saying patients for patient safety right that is there has to be a group and now we are there that is that initiative has started to and we are now asking the hospitals also you work with these communities you work with the patients so that they have input into what the hospital does right so now the the emphasis will come on to this area and certainly this is an area that in sri lanka we have to in fact i i was trying to find some of our retired people who might do lead that because you know our people are still not, not at that level of uh, understanding and they think you know the doctor belongs on a pedestal and whatever he says is right you know without understanding that they are also human and they can make mistakes too right there's no point in highlighting in the media after that because that is just a sensationalism of all the bad things that can go wrong in our system you know so okay so there's a multi there this christ so when you have all these stakeholders involved you have a very rich dialogue because you get perspectives and that's very important to understand the different processes especially when you're planning because you must understand all these different people see things differently right and that's very important sometimes there's conflict but conflict also is advantages to us because some from those conflict you can you can get an idea of some of the other issues you know if everybody agrees on everything you don't need to bring everybody in if they all agree and they all think the same there's no point right even in a marriage why should two people always agree good if there's a little dispute then you can uh, work out the best solution right yeah so that's that's the idea so anyway there has to be regular supervision and monitoring and evaluation as as in anything that you do so we have also a regular supervision mne and we conduct these quarterly performance reviews as i mentioned and the uh, biannual performance reviews for the provincial health institutions uh, base hospital and above uh, often uh, quarterly so definitely quarterly then the standard formats are there we have sent them out they have 20 general indicators and other indicators uh, that we look at uh, they have to report on all of those and a tool was developed to supervise these primary medical care institutions as well we have a checklist developed and uh, these these are also done and supervised so the health information and quality uh, improvement project uh, which is a global fund uh, project uh, has supported us in some of these activities and uh, they have we have planned and initiated on this project it's going to go on till 2024 and accreditation of healthcare institutions has been planned also under this project so that is uh we are having initial consultations on that and we hope to take this forward because unless we have our own standards but by the way we have looked at we started out with the australian council actually their their health standards uh and uh, uh we got people trained in fact there are there are several uh, surveyors who were trained under that but we need to take this forward because at the end of the day if we are thinking even of medical tourism we have to be accredited there is no other way you have to be accredited so we have to push this forward this is the way we can raise the bar then the gap analysis of the national quality management unit uh, national quality management system uh, we did a gap analysis uh, dr karandogara was our external uh, local consultant for this process he did a gap analysis last year and based on this gap analysis we are actually funding uh, hospitals to help them improve their quality uh so under main themes like training which he identified the training of staff then uh, the infrastructure of the quality management unit and the logistics and also of course global fund because its mandate is about tb hiv and malaria we, and that is that is part of their mandate we also have to look at those three specific disease entities 
So the funds are will be allocated. I they said we initially thought about 1.5 million, which is a fair sum given the financial constraints that we have this year from the government. So we are hoping it can be a little more. In fact, now the global fund tells us because the dollar has we has depreciated and dollars appreciated. Uh, we might even be able to give about two 2.5 million to each of the institutions, which is fairly significant. They can do a few things, uh, hopefully to improve. Uh, so celebration of world patient safety. I just say a few words about that. Uh, as I said, sept uh, September 17th is a Sunday. So 15th and 16th, we will, we will try and have a two day co convention, probably in the BMICH, uh, very likely. And uh, we will have, you know, a fair number of participants. I think they expect about 600 or so for each 650 for each day so that we will cover a lot of the stakeholders and invite them in including of course our medical staff so the the dhqs has uh, has different activities we are, that we are hoping to do sharing best practices media conferences video clips national events by the way if you, you we have a website so a lot of this information that i'm sharing with you you can go to the website and also see um so as i told you the accreditation process we are working on we have to have a national council uh nca and a working committee we started out with ac uh, hs which is the uh, australian council for health standards because and they trained our people for as uh, surveyors they are still in the system some of them very few have retired and uh, uh, we intend to uh, do this uh, process and uh, under the debt to health uh, project proposal and of course the gaps uh, again, uh, the analysis, as you said, was, which was done, has made certain recommendations, which I told you about. And uh, based on that, we have training needs. We are developing, revising the curricula for critical health staff, right? This CPD curricula, we, again, uh, the University of Colombo also has got involved because of their, uh, their, their department in, that looks at health curriculum. So, so Professor Indika Karunaratna also has been a part of our we are planning for this and also the CPD. And finally, I believe the CPD program is getting a little bit of recognition. The, recently, the DG issued a circular. It is now becoming, because for a long time we had opposition, often the trade unions had objections to it because it was difficult to get training everywhere in the country. So getting CPD points and tying it in with re-registration was what was the need of the hour. But unfortunately, we couldn't do that. There was a lot of opposition because people couldn't. But now online, you know, you can link in and watch programs like this. And, and improve your knowledge. And unless we do this, unless we make it, man, it's done elsewhere in other countries, especially the developed countries, you can't just go on based on your knowledge that you got from medical faculty, right? As Professor Anjana quite rightly said, you know, I mean, after 10 years, it is, you know, antique. You know, you're, you become an antique. I remember the first lecture by Professor Carla Fonseca at the Galama Faculty Physiology Lecture Theater, he told you 50% of what I'm going to teach you will not be true when you pass out. I don't know which 50%, right? And it's true, it's true. So after we have passed out, that knowledge is gone, right? And you have to relearn, right? So you, this, that's a reality, that's a reality. So un, training is absolutely crucial. Continuous professional development, absolutely crucial. Otherwise we are going to become, you know, just some kind of, you know, person sitting in, you know, you get these chronic cases, right? In our system, unfortunate. And as Sir said, we don't get rid of them. Those chronics are kept there. There are liabilities to our system, but we don't do anything about it. They are kept somewhere. You try to hide them. In fact, I had a director ask me, there's a, this type of person coming. Where can, we, where can we hide this person? I said, sir, you want to hide this doctor in hospital? Where to hide? He said, no, can we think of some place? Finally, they hid in the, in the medical statistics unit. <laughs> right? Because you can't put in the OPD. He first said OPD. I said, my goodness, first, first care, no? first patient contact. You don't put that type of person into that place, you know. But see, we don't get rid of them. We don't get rid of them. We keep these people. They are chronics. You know, they are not going to change also in a hurry. Anyway, that's just by the way. It's my, my own experience I'm trying to share with you before I <laughs> finish it off. Okay, compilation of data on patient satisfaction service. As Dr. Citizen said, we are moving away from patient satisfaction service to patient experience service. Right? We are piloting it now because it's actually the patient experience because, you know, the satisfaction surveys are biased. Why? At the end of the day, just before they leave, we are giving a survey. Now they are in the unit. Now they have to fill it out. Right? Obviously, there's going to be a bias. No, can they start saying something? They have a follow-up clinic to come to. 
ஒன்ஸ் <laughs> form in 2012 the incident reporting form we have revised this year readmissions forms uh, are there uh, because that's very important also for us as a as a indicator with how many readmissions we are getting very poor collection of data on that process and performance review format also was revised and so there's a new format from this year because we the some of the older ones you know with the stakeholders we have we have changed then of course there is a the units qm muse they have a, we have a, that we have established in 2013 that was revised also uh, and the incident reporting guidelines again revised this year the guidelines for proper maintenance of bedage ticket dg dghs asked us to revise it because there were some issues with the, the maintenance of a bedage ticket especially post surgery you know the, the bedage ticket is a legal document that is that's the only thing you know when it goes to court case that what is written on that is the only way we can defend ourselves there has to be documented well right we can't emphasize that enough right you you will sometimes stand on that by the way negligence is very difficult to prove right we know that that's why some of the problems are there for legally to prove negligence you have to say someone with similar similar qualification similar experience would have done something differently now that's very difficult to prove that's why often litigation doesn't work in our system it's not easy to prove that right okay guidelines for reporting readmissions also from 2016 we've had and we have calculated waiting time for patients in opd and clinics that's also we ask them to report because waiting times also an indicator of how well your system works now very often in our system it is the lab that the delay is there 2 hours sometimes right 2 hours to get a lab report and sometimes understandable it's understandable but the other things are generally they have been able to shorten the period of waiting to see the see the you know the consultant in the clinic uh, getting the drugs all those systems tend to have improved and you know within within 2 hours you can do all that but if you have to wait for lab reports and other things you will wait the half a day right and our appointment system also the, we have initiated that uh, it doesn't necessarily always work because our people have transport issues there is only one bus from their destination to come they have to take that morning bus anyway you see so there are other issues that uh, talk you know speak into this same issue so then we have a manual for the quality uh, healthcare quality uh, and that augments our cbd modules uh, and uh, the quality supervision tool also for primary medical care institutions also is all in we are working on that will be digitalized also so many of these things will yeah, as you can see there's a picture there there are four six uh, six uh, categories this was uh, developed with jica and the ministry in 2010 dr sridharan played a, a major role in in developing those as well and um, we have instructions on prescribing medicines at inpatient outpatients to minimize medication errors then we are working on these last three magnetic mri safety guideline post operative observation chart and the guidelines for management of center uh, cssds right that we are working on currently that's in 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 the works at the moment this year the best practices we will highlight right and innovations that they do that so we encourage that we want to showcase that that's why i said we are having a national annual convention on world patient safety day and then the smaller division of hospitals we found they are very in some of the they, if the leader is good and very enthusiastic they seem to get to a lot of things because they are, they kind of have the time on their hands they are underutilized no so they have time to do some quality things you know because people are bypassing some of these smaller institutions that's also a sad sad situation you know in our system that needs to be corrected because the quality of care can be better rather than overcrowding a central uh, place and, and but then again our people have to understand these ideas then of course the hospitals are conducting as i said patient satisfaction surveys and uh, we are moving on so at least twice a year every six months they should conduct one and uh, then they they at the review at the review we will uh, we will look at their survey as well the findings and what steps they have taken as a result of that survey because that's very important no point in doing all these things without at the end of the day acting on whatever you have learned from that otherwise measuring is use, useless no no point in measuring and not doing anything about it right so patient satisfaction is an impact indicator and that has been even identified by the project office 
So we are looking at that. Hospitals are conducting these uh, surveys on a, on a regular basis. And uh, we, we also the employee satisfaction. I told you the internal customer matters to us. So that also should have been, should also be done. I don't know how many of you have had em, uh, employee satisfaction surveys in this hospital. I hope you are, you are being surveyed, right? Because that's also very important. We need to know, I told you a, a satisfied employee is more productive, right? And we'll, we'll be able to deliver. Okay, so clinical audits, I already mentioned this, at least one clinical audit per quarter. Yeah, we expect, and we expect that, you know, that also will be reviewed. We are trying to enc encourage that because it's not done across the system very well. Uh, finally, there is the incident reporting and learning system. We have talked about many of these. We collect data on patient accidents, adverse events near misses. This is from issue uh, circular issued in 2013. So, and then the adverse event analyzing form from 2016, we have guidelines on this adverse event reporting system, and we have a circular now from DG also that introduced these forms and guidelines and uh, in implementing this uh, adverse event. Uh, so these are monitored uh, in the reviews, the incident reporting format and guidance was revised this year, early this year, we again revised it. And uh, we have a medication incident reporting format, which is on the process of being finalized, along with a near miss reporting form. It's also being developed. So all these new things that have to come into the system will be brought in again this year. We are constantly doing this. And we encourage hospitals to have established work improvement, or as we said, quality circles in all wards and units of hospitals. Every single person from the top to the bottom in working unit should belong to a quality circle because everybody's input Everybody has a responsibility towards quality. Nobody can say it's not our job, right? In the healthcare system, we have to work as a team. There are no individual heroes, as often Dr. Sridharan presents in his thing. There are no individual heroes in this game. It is a teamwork. We can't deliver unless we work as a team. No individual can deliver. There are people who are individually skilled and highly capable, but unless they work together, they cannot do it. And by the way, there are two soft skills you absolutely need, regardless of how qualified you are. You need good communication skills and you, good, you need good relationship skills. You have to work with a team and you have to clearly communicate. If you don't have those, however qualified you are, what use, right? And we have seen this in many, many systems. So uh, many hospitals have functional wits that are carrying out and we hope that that will further flourish. And uh, for m and &E, again, we told you that we do it quarterly and biannually. And uh, we, we hope that also these reviews will lead to other, you know, uh, uh, indicators such as in medicine, surgery, and pediatrics and obstetrics, which are, which are also revised. And we will revise the performance format also again that was introduced. We have revised. Uh, supervision, again, I, I don't want to bore you with all these details about, but you can see this on our website as well, uh, or how supervision takes place and the a monthly quality assessment. Even COVID-19, we, we monitored uh, the treatment centers and the quality steering committees. That's another thing that I need to emphasize on the quality steering committees. Is a high, these things don't seem to operate very well in the institutions. And we actually need a national steering committee on healthcare quality and safety that is planned. And we are, under that, there may be some subcommittees, but at a national level, we do need to have that. So that, that ends my presentation. Thank you for uh, your attentive listening. I hope I haven't bored you. I hope I've given you some other ideas as well. And I, and I hope that we will really do something more because we have the capacity to do so. And it doesn't depend on, I know we are in a difficult time. We are losing people, in HR issues and finances, but quality improvement can be done regardless because it is up to our individual to try and do something a little bit better right tomorrow than you and then today and in that end we will you know we'll really improve our system so thank you very much thank you very much dr allen and uh, now i think uh, i want the speakers to come to the, the table so that uh, we can have some discussion uh, let's see whether there are any you can send your comments or anything in the chat come Or you can ask questions. Can I start with a, shall we?
about clinical governance, uh, which is introduced in UK, I think in the UK after some uh, mishaps which had happened in the healthcare uh, some time back. So there are seven pillars that they describe as uh, I think we were discussing that. So, like, uh, so it is important that uh, risk management, uh, the education and training, the clinical audits, uh, the, uh, the clinical effectiveness, uh, research and development, and the openness. So these are the seven, uh, and the, uh, the whole structure, I think those are uh, important to be thought about. So all were discussed uh, by different speakers and uh, experts on this field. So one thing that I would like to ask in this uh, setting is now, uh, we have guidelines developed, but uh, now one good thing that we heard was about the CPD points and uh, the mandatory uh, requirement as a, learning even that you have to continue but uh, training for the doctors that's a very good sign uh, but uh, uh, do we like uh, the communication i have seen that it's uh, not uh, very effective like even what you have said now you have said that because i was also involved with this uh, development of the incident reporting format uh, sometime years back but i never knew that it was updated and it was not received by us the new format and the new guidelines so so that communication there's a gap so how do you think uh, we can improve that? Uh, yes, sometimes, uh, I mean, all the stakeholders, while they're invited, may not necessarily be able to participate in all our consensus, you know, the type of things that we do. But from time to time, we revise. The only thing is sometimes these, have to, yeah, these are sent out through the ministry and it goes to uh, the head of the institution. And the, if it doesn't get distributed to the rest of the yeah. units and the other relevant stakeholders, that's where we have issues. Yeah. Now, the problem is the directorate can't send it directly to the, all these people. So it comes through this channel. There again, you know, that's where the, you know, the communication issues can arise. It, it, it goes to the RD, it'll go to the PD. And then it has to filter down into their, to their institutions under their purview. So we have also understood that there is sometimes I mean, how, how you can't also keep on plaguing them and say, have you sent it to everybody? You know, because they also depend on their staff to uh, send it to the re relevant person. And now, you know, during that lockdown period and all that, everything was sent by email, right? There were no hard copies, it was mail. Now, when it goes into an email, you don't know what, it ha what happens to it. Sometimes it goes into spam. Sometimes, it, you know, it is uh, lying on, you know, they'll print it out and leave it on some, in, on some file or in some tapel, you know, file, and that's the end of it. You know, so that's where I think we have to maybe look at that these actually end up going to the relevant parties. So sometimes that's the reason we do revisions with a lot of effort, actually. It takes a lot of time because it goes back, back and forth, back and forth with those who are participating, and it takes a fair amount of time to do the revisions. So because there are, as I said, so many stakeholders. So uh, we have we will have to look at and try and refine the process of disseminating the information. Of course, these are often on our website, but how many people go to the website and check these documents to see whether it has been revised or not? So there's there's an issue. There's an issue with that. I agree. We have to look do something so that the relevant yeah. people uh, actually receive it. So maybe we'll have we might have to take the initiative to send it rather than being dependent on it being sent by say the DG's office. Small SMS alert system where 
In truth, uh, I uh, sorry. Yeah, in, in truth, uh, we didn't have the capacity the capacity to do that. We have we didn't have a IT officer. Now we uh, the quality healthcare directorate has to have uh, that kind of staff who will do that. You know, even our website revising our website. So we are now borrowed the Casa Street Hospital uh, IT. You know, uh, the uh, informatics officer. And I I. You know, now, for example, temporarily, I have a, another lady also, a doctor who's also attached to the unit. But so that's why we are able to do that. But you're quite right. Those type of things will make it simpler. So we are looking at that, developing it in, in such a way that uh, we can, you know, disseminate, as you say, through an SMS or something. But uh, yes, that, that is on the cards. When, but, but we need the people to keep on, you know, we need, I will need to card, which is not easy during this time. As you know, we can't recruit. And management services, you have to get over through all this rigmarole of getting card approved for this type of, because you really need a, a separate designated person who is constantly looking at it and updating and, you know, without someone like this, I, it's very hard because we have limited uh, staff, right? I have a deputy, uh, uh, three consultants who are not permanently there, they will go on transfer and uh, also uh, the other office staff, which also they have fair amount of work altogether about 18 people. Right, which is not not adequate for. In fact, the DDG MS one under whom this director comes under wants to make this a bureau, because there is so much of work that needs to be done. Like the epid unit, where you have different different designated officers handling different aspects. Here too, we need to have officers who are you know designated, and there isn't that kind of. We hadn't planned for it. This has expanded the work of the quality and safety has expanded so much that we haven't kept up with that kind of need, but that's so even for the hospitals, right? I mean, we are, we are struggling with that to find a human resource for designate, you know, things that will really, you, unless you have a designated person, the job doesn't get done. Otherwise, it's just diluted. Even in many cases, quality management units, they don't have a quality MO, right? They are having the planning unit MO, look after quality. That does not work. Yes, thank you. And um, yeah, I think uh, we did not discuss much about the prevention of health care associated infections, though it's my area. I didn't want to have a section on that since uh, it's done, I think, and it's uh, talked about in other forum. But uh, this is uh, actually another important area where I think microbiologists uh, all over the country are taking the leadership and doing a great job, by hope, I think, because uh, uh, the the thing is like uh, as we all discussed, it's not a it's not a uh, you know passive uh, approach that we should take, and uh, we, we are looking for the problems. We have to look for the probable places where the mistakes can happen, and have a program proactively uh, to tackle them. So that is the attitude that we should have in other units as well. So infection control unit, we usually have our guidelines. We, we do our regular audits, we have audit program. And when you do an audit, we have to take the corrective action, we have to re-audit and see whether there's an improvement. So these are the things that are, it's not easy to get everything done. The other thing may be sometimes though we think the technology, we, but we discussed a little about it, but some of these new technology, which is available, though they may appear a little um, you know, expensive, uh, they may be cost effective. Sometimes now, for example, uh, at one point uh, when we had a lot of uh, needle stick injuries, uh, we, we always monitor them and we look for the, 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 we look into the details, how it happened and we see how we can prevent it. That is the important thing, why we report. Otherwise people just write it and that, that's it. That is not what we should do. We have to see whether they have followed the guidelines and if, if so, uh, can we improve it further? Whether the guideline needs to be changed or why, if not followed, what's the reason? Whether the resources were not available, the training was not adequate. So we have to, the root cause analysis is a practical thing that we have to learn uh, to do in a, in a very effective way. So by doing that, we realized that a lot of uh, accidents were happening uh, due to the sillets of the, you know, like uh, the sillets of the cannulae. 
So there are devices which have safety devices, uh, which are much, I mean, once there was an accident uh, in a patient, like as well, because we didn't know from where it had happened, uh, a puncture uh, of a stillet. So uh, later, it was a, it's a, these things can happen when they just, uh, they, they are supposed to discard it into a sharp bin, but practically, uh, sometimes it doesn't happen the, the immediately. So there are better ways to do it. So the new technology can be used. So the, these also are things that we should think and that proactively and also maybe reactive, uh, but then taking the corrective action will uh, include those as well. As we all discussed uh, the whole morning, we have to get out of this punitive culture. We are, we are, we are always trying to blame someone, uh, shout at someone and finish it off. That's it. But that is that will not prevent it happening again. So this is the co concept that I think we should all uh, cultivate in our, our uh, society. Uh, so in each unit, uh, if something, uh, as we all discussed today, uh, if we have our own audits, uh, identify our quality indicators, what we want to do, what how we want to improve them, and have our own programs, plans for audits and uh, the regular audit program for the year at least. Uh, Simple things, maybe not every day, every month, but at least something, if you plan and uh, execute, that uh, will start somewhere, I think, to have a quality system in place. Because the quality units don't have, as you say, uh, very uh, experts uh, in all hospitals. So the, the directors and other consultants have to take the lead to have their own programs in their units. Otherwise, it will not happen. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes. sector, uh, what we did was, uh, you know, this, now in this discharge process, well, uh, few questions were there. Now, uh, this number one is the quality of discharge summary. Quality of discharge summary was not so good in the documentation, uh, and the other thing is the discharge, the timing of the discharge, and the time taken, waiting time for the discharge. Uh, Safety of discharge patients, safe discharge. And so those three issues we have to address. So that in order to do so, this uh, documentation, so we train the medical officers, and then in order to systematize it, uh, we put it to the system. And then uh, we did a trial uh, in board, uh, I think it's like not in board AC or the medical and in the board. And then we started, there are a lot of resistance and you know, drawbacks, and then some people wanted money. <laughs> to write a good discharge uh, summary. So that is the duty of them, but they were fired of this <laughs> to write a good discharge summary. So there are good discharges and bad discharges. <laughs> so then we said no. So we, yes, we have to do a good discharge summary and then put it to the system and then it, it works. And then the other thing is the discharge, the type of uh, discharge, you know, the waiting time. So that the waiting time, the root causes of waiting times, we did a study, complete the proper study, and then we identified the different, uh, you know, the consultants consenting, the final diagnosis, uh, and then, uh, financial, uh, updating the bills uh, from different uh, service departments. So those things we have to uh, uh, rectify those issues also, and then get in the main, other main issue was the discharge. Um, so 
send the consumers to be discharged so that the, uh, this uh, be centralized, be centralized to the pharmacy and then they put it to the system so that the system requests the discharge drugs, then the pharmacy uh, takes the responsibility of distributing those uh, drugs to the wards where they are to assist them in the pharmacy department. So they are the runners to bring the drugs uh, quickly and then we were able to curtail the discharge. Uh, but then it's a whole process, so that they didn't really work with. And the same problem is that we have been having here. We had the <laughs> risk management committee yesterday. They said that, you know, pharmacy drugs coming to the discharge point also not so good. Direct, uh, we discussed about this uh, you know, streamlining the discharge process at the death. Yes, uh, discharge is very important thing actually, and we have lots of uh, issues with discharge. On basically, we have a discharge checklist. And some of the I believe, when you talk about the Saturday, that they are tasked with the proper discharge of the checklist. So, yeah, it's a uh, still use. You see, the issue also is one other issue that I have found with discharges is why certainly the documentation has to be done properly and uh, regarding the follow up and all those things that we. Other thing is, is being discharged on time. We discharge a patient and keep it. I don't know why that should happen because I remember earlier when we didn't have so many people uh, in truth because we needed to discharge at 12. We used to write part of these diagnosis charts while we are doing other work. Sometimes even inside the theater, we are writing the, this thing so that the patient can go in on time. And I think that type of responsiveness to patients we must realize has to be a part and parcel of quality. Because if we are discharging them, they have made arrangements for transport. Sometimes they have hired vehicles and they are coming in waiting. And then we say can't discharge. Wait, wait till evening. It, it's unfair. It is not that's not quality. You have put them, you know, made them inconvenience them to a great extent, which involves finance as well. Right. So and I don't know, we, we have increased numbers, uh, you know, of interns, but you know, I, I've always been said, I've always said this increasing numbers doesn't mean quality improves. In truth, I have seen it otherwise. Why? The work that was done earlier by one or two individuals is now shared by more, and they are divided the work. That same amount of work is divided, and then others they know don't have the responsibility. No, it's not that wasn't our, our patient, wasn't our job. It, so that doesn't improve quality. You would expect that quality should have improved if you increase the numbers and the you know the, you have given them the capacity to do it. But it doesn't happen, unfortunately. And so that's where I think we really have to relook at some of the ways in which we do these things, so that you know the the, the quality improves not just not just in in in, in, in one paper. We can have this checklist, but are we really? Is it really you know impacting the patient at the end of the day? Because they they have to make sure that they have got everything that they that they have understood whether there is a follow up when they have to come all those things. Because sometimes our patients don't ask. You know, maybe they are too scared to ask. You know, sometimes they are. They are too scared to ask you. You know, to find out. Some of them we don't even know the diagnosis. You know, look at the diagnosis. They don't know what you know what they are. What what even the names of the drugs they do not know. Now that was addressed with medication safety. They don't even know what they are taking. Right. So these are type of things where they should know when they are being discharged what drugs are kept, that they have to take it continuously, especially when it's for chronic conditions. So there are a lot of you know little little issues that we have to look at when it comes to the discharge and I think that is another area that we will have to concentrate on and with the necessary stakeholders because different different units will have different you know em the emphasis is different for example from a surgical board you know, there are certain things that will be more more relevant there than in others so like that we have to we have to really you know custom make it to so that in the discharge checklist probably will have to be worked out from the relevant units also, what is really because a common list may sometimes not work. Yeah. Uh, very little to add, uh, especially surgery, but uh, I agree with what he said. This, this timing of this, yeah, there was, I, I also came across this misconception that some people believe that people can be discharged only at 12 and 5 o'clock. I had to change that at LR, and then there are a lot of other things we could easily change. Uh, for instance, uh, at the LRH, 
father was allowed to stay with the patient. So I, with greatest difficulty, I changed it because now the percentage of children don't have their mothers. They are in Middle East. And it is far better to have the father so, than the very old grandmother who is having osteoarthritis. And uh, when she is having trouble, she gets the child discharged earlier than should have happened. So we have noticed all these things. But uh, specifically talking about surgery in government hospitals, we don't have a discharge summary as that. I mean, that's a good thing if we can introduce that. But what we have is this uh, diagnosis card. And I have come across quite a lot of junior doctors are the people who write this. They don't know why this diagnosis, the purpose of this diagnosis card. Sometimes they add unnecessary information into the diagnosis card like surgeon's name and qualifications and who did the operation, house officer did the... Now, imagine if you do a house officer, if they don't allow house officers to do it, but uh, just unnecessarily house officer's name is mentioned that appendicectomy is done by this thing, that can have... Uh, and we are not trying to hide any information, but people should get information as the diagnosis card, these there uh, should for that person to take it to some other person. Or if they come to the same hospital, it may be another person who sees that should be able to understand what happened to the patient. So that's the, and sometimes they repeat what is in the PhD in the diagnosis card, unnecessary information. In surgery, what crucial information is, one is the operation number. They have undergone a major or minor operation. We register it and give the operation number. Now that should be there and the date. And then if the patient comes back, they can always trace the details of the operation. You don't have to write the details of the operation in the diagnosis card. Another thing is if there is a small ad uh, adverse event or a mishap, supposing as my mentioned, cecum was damaged. Uh, during appendicectomy, that should not be written in bold letters and underlines. <laughs> People don't have common sense. Uh, so that's the other thing. Third thing is I used to insist that every diagnosis should have a plan of action section written at the end so that the patient in patient's language, patient can understand the patient is referred to the clinic, so just should on such and such a day, if there's a medication, all of that should be very briefly written. So, and ideally, I think if we can improve, uh, referral letter uh, can give, be given to the person who originally referred this patient. Now, that happens in other countries now. Those who are practicing in UK and we know that there is an automatic letter generated uh, from every patient to the GP. So, we, we also can do that because the patient can be officially handed over and it's good for that person also to know what happened to his patient. So these are some areas which we can improve. Thank you. What, one uh, question about what you said, Dr. Francis, as, uh, just uh, now you said that you need not write details of the surgery, but in our setting, the patient may not uh, always come to the same hospital next time when they get a complication. I think that has to be changed in a way. I think still we are and working in the operation. Uh, yeah, we identified, but uh, of notes and the yeah. date is there, then they can be always used to phone and yeah, uh, we are supposed to maintain an operation register. Yeah, but uh, something like a damage to the seeker might be important for us. No, no, it should be <laughs> no, 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 it should be mentioned, but not uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they may end up in another hospital where they are, we don't have details. That is yeah. when uh, the card is No, no, the details are the patient yeah. should be there. Especially in this setting. I think it's setting also should change because I think we should have this normal. The good. I think there was something developed by the ministry earlier about the referral system, like where the cluster system should yeah, be. That, that is how it should be. I mean, people should not be just going around uh, wherever they want. I mean, that is one drawback that we have in our system where I think that's why the major hospitals as you said are more crowded and we can't provide a good service whereas the small places where they have qualified people are not getting enough patients so that has to change so uh, basically so for the current situation I think uh, it's very useful to have a detailed <laughs> card for us because they come in the here from somewhere else and we don't know what has gone uh, through like uh, what, what they have gone through uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Another important thing is now, you know, this is my long year 
self experience, but they are, uh, they have found those. Yes, I have done a lot of investigations about this uh, same generation and so on. Uh, now, here, uh, what are, you know, the, the relationship between the nurses and the doctors uh, are poor in all hospitals everywhere. The problem is now nurses do the procedures, right? The doctors are in the ward, the house uh, officers, the senior officers, the registrars. So there is no cohesiveness uh, among them. So then, uh, when these nurses do the procedures, they do wrong things. But uh, you know, this, uh, the medical officers are not bothered. Medical officers don't uh, scrutinize, don't uh, follow up, don't watch uh, what is happening uh, during their procedures. So that is, uh, you know, so all the people should get together in the ward and then say, be vigilant. That's why in my slide, the last slide, last sentence. Yes, reliance and vigilance is very important. Say, for instance, I, I can give one example. One radiologist, he was doing a kidney biopsy, and then the nurse produced uh, two bottles. This, uh, one is the formal saline, the other one is uh, saline bottle. And then, uh, instead, the nurse has brought uh, two formal saline bottles. And then uh, the radiologist has put the uh, specimen to both bottles. But the radiologist never uh, took interest just to ask the nurse what is formal saline and what is saline. At that point, you know, they would have prevented that uh, serious mistake. So those things uh, happen. And the other important thing is there is no teamwork. Teamwork in managing uh, patients. Uh, and then because of that, there is no relationship among the uh, multidisciplinary team. Uh, and then uh, this, uh, the, uh, it causes uh, unnecessary deaths. Hospital, we have come across a number of deaths because of that. And the other thing is, uh, in my example, I saw only one case. Uh, the others, what happens is, how, uh, especially during nights, when you get panic values, the medical officers should uh, have the intelligence of uh, uh, collating all the issues of the patient and then come out uh, come out an uh, immediate decision immediate decision whether this patient needs uh, intervention during the same night or next day morning say for the if you get uh, this there's one patient we are uh, critical value was reported at 11 p.m uh, as a high potassium value so then the nurses informed the outcall medical officer without coming to the patient uh, uh, he has said, uh, ah, I can check a person and then take a hit over the nephrologist to give one at it. So then uh, early morning at five o'clock, patient did. So then if the nephrologist was informed uh, during the same night, he would have given back and you know, this, uh, you the patient's potassium levels. So those things can happen. So that's why it's very important. That's why in this uh, quality, quality they describe the four D. Among these uh, different different teams managing patients, auxiliary team, coordinating teams like that, core team. So the core team is the medical officers, consultants, nurses, patients, uh, party. So all of them should get together and then manage. So one instance uh, where in the ICU, one patient having a fracture, uh, multiple fractures around the ankle, 38 year old lady. And then the patient, the fracture was correct, and then the patient was in the ICU. And then uh, uh, the surgeon, the surgeon uh, looked after the patient. In the meantime, ICU, the anesthetist also came and uh, examined the patient, and then uh, she said that there could be pulmonary embolism, early signs of pulmonary embolism, she noted. And then the medical officer, yesterday morning, Informed the surgeon uh, that the anesthetist suggested to do a, do a referral to the cardiologist and get a scan so that you can early detect it. So then the next day morning, when it was suggested, uh, uh, it was not uh, taken up seriously. And then uh, evening, the patient started becoming bad. So then they, then the medical officer uh, tried to coordinate. Then uh, it was denied. And then the next day morning, uh, patient died. 
in the post mortem reveal the massive pulmonary embolus. So why didn't the this uh, consultant, you know, this consultant medical officers, anesthetists, all of them come to it? At least the anesthetist who has seen the patient during the night, he would have been, uh, contacted the surgeon immediately and informed that you know there is a suspicion, and then you would have uh, emphasized that this patient should be referred to the cardiologist and then uh, uh, do the investigation, do the echo and uh, procedure. So those things uh, happen. So, so these things can lead to uh, unacceptable. That's why this core team is very important. Team, uh, discussing each other. Right now, if you take a first uh, case, what corrective action should be taken now when this incident happened? Yes. Now the important thing is that it should not happen again. Yes. So how how can we improve the quality in the system? The quality system has to be improved uh, to prevent such incidents. Uh, that is the important thing I yeah, think we should discuss. The, the first thing that about this potassium, yeah. potassium level. So we developed a, you know, this uh, red, red seal where this critical value reporting. So that critical value reporting, all this critical value reported, who has informed, who has taken the blood, and then who has taken the action also. So up to, up to that point, uh, this uh, only information uh, details were there. So what the action was taken, uh, we have to endorse it. Okay. Documented and it is a visual control. Right. So the guidelines were amended yeah. and you had some check yes. checklist or some seal or something seal, yes. introduced. Yes. So these and then the education and training of the staff. So I think uh, Sajit now, since you are from the medical faculty, I, I would like to uh, stress this importance because of the medical students who come. Uh, sometimes they are not trained enough on infection prevention and control when they come for clinicals. Even the nursing students, I know this. The one thing is they are not uh, trained on the procedure, so they make mistakes or they can make mistakes. And uh, there are certain fundamental things that we have to follow anyway, the guidelines. They have to be educated on the guidelines on infection prevention and control and whatever we have on safety. Uh, that has to be the, like the induction program. It should be not only for the new uh, recruits, but it is before that for the students. Yeah, they are they are less experienced and they make more mistakes. So we have to train them before they come. So I noticed this and for one batch, I think I voluntarily did the lecture like thing online those days with the COVID. But next batch again came without any training. So uh, they get invariably oh, it's they are, the timing in the curriculum sometimes. They yeah, I mean not, maybe they have had the little training, but I mean what I want is like more of a sort of a Institutional guidelines should be given now. They go to different different hospitals. Yes. So when they go to these hospitals, before they come in, now they have three hospitals. Uh, so if we can uh, educate them and train them on these guidelines, at least take one day for the students, that would be great. So, yes, that's a very valid comment. Uh, so I will uh, definitely inform it to the phase two coordinators as well. And the other no, the the way of uh, eating out is uh, the CPDs. So SLMA has a CPD uh, platform already. So now, as I mentioned, now we have the national cycle also. So we thought of uh, Jagdhu Pura also, we are planning out, uh, just we are planning out to put a proposal to at the uh, university level. So also, we, because we are having the LMS, uh, learning management systems and at the university levels also to introduce these CPDs for the students uh, for them to get the CPD points uh, and uh, work out. So, likewise, as small, as small modules, so that can also uh, prevent such uh, Technically, I will uh, inform it to the I think all the all the faculties. Uh, okay, yeah, definitely yeah. for all the faculties. All the faculties to have a policy like coming up uh, at the national level. So why don't we start up at the university level and train them for the CPDs when they become uh, the medical officers and uh, the consultants? So they will they will eventually they will follow the national CPDs. So it will be a very easy thing for us to in another five or eight years to get the CPD points and get the uh, next five years very straight. So we are actually looking at it at the undergraduate level as well. I mean, the, the revising the curriculum at the undergraduate because you have to start them very early. 
in these concepts uh, like patient safety and quality, but it must be theory. Yes. Yeah. It has to be practical. And in fact, what we are trying to do is have different students that will form the team in the future to come together. Because one of the problems that we had and you pointed out is our people don't work with the others in the team. Right? They work in silos. They don't want to bring in all the other people. You say they know this is our, just our job. We don't want to have. But actually, if you train them by students that they are working in a in a in a, a team with other people from different uh, you know training training schools, then it's much better because they do this abroad. They actually have these uh, simulation centers where they actually bring st nursing students, medical students, all the other physiotherapy, whatever other fields, and they work as a team. Once they get that into their head that they are not alone and they have to communicate with the others on the team, then that concept might be taken into the actual hospital where they work. Yeah. Am I allowed to ask a question from uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, regarding the adverse event reporting you all introduced it some time ago. I heard that you are going to introduce uh, dynamics reporting also. That just mean, does that mean that uh, it has been successful or implemented successfully? Adverse events. Yes. No, the problem with adverse events is it's underreported. Still, still it's underreported. Uh, the main adverse event you can imagine falls. Right, main adverse events falls. The other is needle stick. Needle right? stick. Yeah, that's Those right. are the main two that we get. Yeah. And, we, and, and now we are in the adverse event. We have to we have to suggest to them a whole list of other possible events. You know, now now we have included impact mitigation also because very rarely will they report that there was a there was an adverse event due to this. Right now we have begun to say like blood, you know, blood reactions and allergies and all that. But really, there are lots of other incidents that are happening. Obviously, right? I mean, it's happening in other places. But how come it's not happening in our system, right? Uh, so th that's the issue. We are, it's underreported. We realize that we are we are trying to prompt them by giving them a, a varying list of you know possible adverse events. So that it will prompt them to think about whether these things have happened or not. But really, actually, in the in truth, we are we are struggling with this, and and this is where I think we have to start uh, introducing this very early on. Because, you know, when you come already working in a unit and you're seeing this, you know, you, you may have limited amount of time or whatever, and you may not, you know, think through these things. But if you know it ahead of time and you anticipate that there are the possibilities of all these things going wrong, you will, you will, and also, of course, the culture that you will report, you know, uh, it, it's like whistleblowers in the private sector. You have to develop that culture where people are wanting to, you know, and it, 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 there's anonymity in our adverse reporting system. You don't have to identify yourself, right? And we are not... Have we managed to get the legal issues sorted out? Because there was yeah. some yeah. debate at some time. Yes, uh, where, you know, because like, now we have two, the form is divided into manner two, where there's a preliminary, uh, you know, information that in, in the first part, and it, it goes to the quality management unit. And then with the authorization of the institutional head, it, it can be looked at by the quality management unit MO along with the unit head, you know, the consultant and the others, if it happened in a particular unit. Because it doesn't have to be divulged to everybody. We want to know what happened, not who, right? Not who was involved, which unit. We, we don't care about that. We want to know whether that incident can be corrected. So these are the these are the real issues that we are facing, and we have to address it in that way. The legal implications of these also have to have to be sorted out because otherwise later on. You know, and our people, as you say, you know, they, they like, if you take a diagnosis card, which is written in red, that such and such a thing was done, it goes to the so media, you know, in social media, we have a field day highlighting that. So that's the problem. They will take something that we have actually reported as a, as a, as an error or as a mistake, and highlight as if all, every day that's happening. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, uh, I, I, I also agree that I was about to ask about these adverse events and the legal issues, uh, because, uh, once I think we got the Dr. Suppose that would also to this team. Can you remember when we were discussing about the adverse event at the beginning? Uh, whether it could be a problem now, say it is reported. Now we do report in our units. Now we sometimes have the incidents and reported as the adverse events, and then we take corrective action in the unit. But this process from there onwards is not happening. I mean, we are not sending, I, I don't know whether that copy that we send, uh, whether it's we have not seen the feedback and the summary. That is why. Uh, so I think that that process is not happening there. Yeah. Because if one incident that happens in one place, 
the others also can learn. That is the idea that we started doing this so that it can be, you know, as a generic uh, incident, we can get uh, some information and learn from it. And all the all the similar, like say, laboratory incident, like it can happen to anybody. So we can share that experience and learn from it. That is that is not happening. So we have not seen any summary of you now what you say whether like whether it comes to you i don't think our incident now though we have some adverse events reported and taken action in our department it doesn't go beyond that probably uh, sometimes we send a copy to the director but i don't know whether it's from there onwards what happens and we don't get a feedback it's supposed to come back to the director yeah. just just the incident okay not, not, not this thing. and what action was taken that's all that's so there is, a, there is a sort of a format where they have to say that no the quality management unit should report it to us okay. it's on their initiative that it happens right. that's why it's so important that uh, yeah that, that's the thing i mean function. i don't think that happens and also about any equipment if it was an equipment was involved no that that happens sometimes maybe there's a error in an equipment which led to the incident yeah. which is very important that it the the, the it is reported to the manufacturer and the company a related company so that is why we we have to i mean that process is still not happening the way we want and uh, so i think it has to be improved so regarding this legal this, aspect i think that's the issue that, that yeah Mr. That, that, mentioned said, at that time yeah. when you were referring to maternal uh, mortality things he said so far no one has challenged or asked yeah. for this uh, confidential investigation report but he said from legal point of view, if a lawyer demands, they can't uh, deny. deny. Right. So, so, so far, so similarly, I think adverse event reporting, uh, root cause analysis data, a clever lawyer might challenge and ask them to produce it. So, so far, it has not happened, but he says it's difficult What's to give indemnity uh, to those things. So, Hospital, it's not a legal thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but they, yeah, this incident reporting and the investigation. Uh, so, in case if you want to go for a sentinel event, we do you know, the investigation, post analysis, and then we will find you know, some problem. And then it has to get into a file. So, that uh, from, from the file, uh, the, the procedure administrative and the legal procedure should be done through that file. So, it, there should be a reference to the incident uh, investigation. So, that's the no, but yeah, the problem was now say uh, some the patient goes to courts, yeah. and if they ask for these documents, no, they can't do the they, We can deny. No, no, we can deny. Okay, incident, that was incident, the show, but but Mr. Kodavar said uh, might have to you know that is. Yeah, yeah he said. The, uh, yeah, at yes. that point, we were yeah, yeah, this thing about yeah, it yeah, because yeah. Uh, they can ask for it. Uh, the director is responsible to produce these documents or something. Was the in, in three occasions, we have uh, uh -huh. oh, okay. they accepted. Right. Yeah, thank so you. The problem is sometimes these complaining parties get these documents from hospitals. Oh, yes. uh, I had a situation where they had all the investigation reports. They are a patient died uh, after else, uh, after appendectomy surgery. Actually, the child had uh, dengue. Blood report uh, or platelets was very low. A blood report has been done, but they have not checked before surgery. So, and the complaining party had all the reports with them, but the hospital said we didn't have a report. So, that type of thing happens. Actually, incident reporting and investigation is a plus point for the hospital uh, for the litigation. So, so because this the no judge, the judge considers that you know, this we have identified the mistake for the error, then we have done the investigation. Then then we have to show the report that we have taken the corrective actions about the producing a checklist, giving a training for them. These are those are plus points for the hospital. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's now lunch time and all must be hungry. And thank you very much uh, for the very uh, insightful uh, discussion and the, the presentations that we had today. Uh, so, if my Sajid, would you like to thank or? Shall I find that? Yeah, okay. On behalf of uh, the Clinical Society of the Sri Dalla Hospital uh, and the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, the resource persons today, as well as the sponsors uh, of the meeting. So, thank you very much. <laughs>